Welcome to The Bow Dudes, a podcast about archery and the lives it has ruined. The Bow Dudes are not responsible for diminishing archery skills or lower IQ. I worry about breathing. Shut up, Jude. And I'm totally lost. God, I keep having to remember that we're PG-13. We were it's help you with those pants. <laughs> no, we did not. <laughs> I'm so glad you have yourself to crack up. Logic and common sense will not be tolerated. This is a very interesting podcast so far. <laughs> Welcome back to the Bow Dudes Podcast. On tonight's podcast, we have a very special guest. He's been here before. He's a friend of ours named Doug Hutchison, owner of Chase Archery. He's been voted the last 20 years as the best string maker in the United States. And so we're really excited to Well, it was the six of us that voted, right? (laughs) Well, it's true. He is the best string maker in the United States. Nobody else counts. That's true. (laughs) It's true. He is the best string maker in the United States. He's also the best at tuning bows, and you need to send your bows to him. Probably not right now, since it's o- o- almost October. But yeah, I'd appreciate it if we wait until say late January. <laughs> <laughs> that was voted on by the Missouri Chigger publication, oh, really? which is actually a publication. Is it? Look Missouri it up, Chiggers. State law. Look it up. There needs to be an oak mite. Swear Boy, to God, no I got joke. a bunch of those, man. Wow. Yeah. We Big got time. Him last weekend. So, Gary. Yes, sir. What did you do in bows this week? Nothing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I, I told Gary bit. we weren't going to do that, and then he got all upset because well, he a, said I actually did something in bows this it's week. It's the first week I actually get to participate in this part of it. Okay. Go. Cool. I helped my neighbor. He was having a rough time. He went to a big box store, and he bought the bow from you, bought the Rampage from you. Big and, box uh, store. He went to a big box store, and they went to help him out, and... He was drawing his bow back, and the string was basically touching his face, past his nose, and he was crouched down in there, and the peep sight was about three inches above the D-loop. I'm like, how in God's name are you shooting that thing? He goes, well, I I got it pretty good earlier. (laughs) All right, let's try something here. Got him stood upright and moved the peep up a little bit. I wasn't able to do it because I didn't have a press, so we just kind of pushed it up, and it was turning a little bit too much, but we got it. You're not supposed to do that. I know that. I said I didn't have a press. Doug told you that last time he was here. Didn't have a (laughs) screwdriver around anywhere? I did, but I wasn't really (laughs) willing to try all that stuff, so I figured I'd just make it work the way we could. And then he, I marked the strain for him and everything. He went and had it put in properly, but he came over the next day, and he had a quick trip lid for 32-ounce cups, which is four inches across maybe, and he was putting – Six out of six arrows inside that at 30. And I mean, I, he was standing straight up. I mean, t- just turning his head and nose was touching the string. But all I did, the the best I could do at the house was just get the peep moved up a little bit. And I shortened his release because he had it way out on the tip of his finger. And he was pulling it way back here trying to get curled in. So we got it. And he was he was actually shooting pretty good the other night. We marked out to 40 in my backyard, and he was out there shooting last night. So. I was inside. I don't care what he was yeah. doing. I'm like, I've been working all day. I'm I've tired, dude. I've been told that inside, you shorten your draw length by tying knots with a string. <laughs> I didn't oh, have a press. I didn't have a press, or we would have tried it. I've seen that but, done. I, have too. But, I did it with a recurve when I was a kid. <laughs> get more poundage out of it too. But we managed to get him shooting pretty decent. He's going hunting this weekend, so. Then he said, man, you got a range finder? So I called Pib. He's like, I really don't want to pay that much for a range finder because I had to buy this and this and this for the bow, so. I grab mine out of the truck and hope he enjoys it. <laughs> Did you hear that, Jack? He's going hunting this weekend. Not me. I said he's going. Oh, you le- you loaned him yours? Yeah. Yeah, that must be nice. I might get it back. Might not. I'll know. knock a little off that if he. All right. If he don't take it, I'm probably going to need one. Mine probably won't ever come back. <laughs> 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 That's all right. He's a nice guy. He'll do some tile work for me, and we'll call it even. Or t- tell you what, Gary, I'll just give you that that range finder. Oh boy. For the. The Arctic Cup. All right. That's close enough. We'll call it good. And I'm good with do that. do with it whatever you want. I'll probably keep it because it's better than the one Cause, I had. Just because that's the kind of guy I am. I appreciate it. Look at that. We need to do more deals on here. I need a new bow. 
<laughs> no, you don't have anything longer than a 25 inch draw length. Never mind. <laughs> no, so you are still an a hole. No. <laughs> well, what, what is it really? 26 and a half or 27? What, my draw length? Yeah. It's right at 28. Oh, my bad. I thought it was shorter than that. And no, I wasn't meant to be a jerk either. <laughs> yeah, you were. <laughs> you ain't fooling nobody. Hey, it you comes across natural. I can't help it. You don't have to mean to be. Hey, what did you do in archery this week, Benny? What did I do in archery this week? I did nothing. Absolutely nothing. Yes, you did. I did not. You said yes, ma'am. I did say yes, ma'am. You took your slide off your bow and gave it to your wife. No, she took it off and took it. And he said, she said, I'm using this. He said, yes, ma'am. She which, got second, right? Which she one took was my that? arrows, too. <laughs> which one was that, Vince? What site? Oh, my Brian's scope. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We saw that the other night. Yeah. On Julie's bow. Where did she go shoot? Yankton. What was the name of the? I don't know. She'll tell me this stuff. Outdoor or something? Outdoor Nationals, I think. It was? Outdoor Target Nationals. Okay. And she got second place. That's what I've heard. All right. Did you see the medal? I have. (laughs) Was it silver? (laughs) It was more Valadium. (laughs) <laughs> she let you wear it? <laughs> she did let me wear it. <laughs> you didn't sleep in it, did you? I worked to bed the other night. <laughs> I hope it looked better. All right, Bob. How about did, you? She did say that you and several other people helped her out by telling her to take her long stabilizer off and add weight and shorten everything up because she was shooting in, what, 80 miles yeah, it was <laughs> it was gusty. Yeah. Gale force wind. They were having... Bow racks blowed over, targets butts blowed over. Hmm. Yeah, it's hard. Pretty intense. They were. She what said they were looking at. They would shoot, and turn around, somebody look at somebody with a spot and scope. Said that hit paper. <laughs> <laughs> you, they hit you, the target. When you're aiming two targets <laughs> down just to hit your target, that's got to be rough. Yeah, she said it was brutal. How many people picked up target panic shooting at that? Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. When they have yeah. a huge indoor facility that they could. <clears throat> call it indoor target nationals instead of outdoor target nationals. <laughs> yeah, because they just shot what? It was a uh, American 900 round, wasn't it? Yeah. 40, was, 50, 60? Oh, it was the 900 round first day and then whatever they shoot at the Dakota Classic the second day. Hmm. Just 40, 50, 60, but it's, it's a 900 round the first day, 600 round the second day, and the target's the second day's just a little smaller. Oh. Hmm. How about you, Bob? Uh, I went down in the basement the other evening and <laughs> changed some stuff around on my indoor bow and uh, mainly just scope, <clears throat> getting it all changed up and ready for indoor. So I'm shooting pretty good. Yeah? Yeah, at I, 12 yards anyway. So but that's all I did. Bib. Too many trucks. Coming by actually, my actually uh, this week I swapped Barb's bow over – for hunting because last Sunday we put a trail camera out and between Sunday and yesterday we got 380 some pictures. Nice. So that one twig just kept blowing back and forth. (laughs) (laughs) We did (laughs) did find out there's a pair of coyotes back there that need to go. We heard them the other night, remember? So they need to go. There's a there's a regular a possum that's a regular back there. A couple of coons that are regular. Some scrub bucks. Oh, four or five different ones of those. There's like a there's a booner six pointer back there. Nice. He probably actually go one ten one twenty as a six pointer. <laughs> hmm. Is there a four point limit in this county? No. Uh oh. No, not in Clay <laughs> County. Not in Barb County, huh? <laughs> she says she don't want him. She says, I won't put him on the wall. I won't shoot him. I'm like, you ain't ever shot one that big. They don't all have to go on the wall, do they? I hope not. <laughs> I said, go get my You need more wall. She my goes, my she goes, wife hopes not. <clears throat> she goes, well, I'll just uh, I'll shoot one of those little scrub bucks. And I said, no, nah, you only get one tag this year. So, yep. But she gets two tags, doesn't she? If you don't gun hunt. You get two bucks. Yep. Right, but she didn't gun hunt. I know, so you'll get two bucks. You still, get, you still kill She'll two. She'll get two bucks. Yeah, that's oh, what she I will? Sh- yeah. yeah, no matter what. That's what I Even if you to... gun hunt, you can shoot one before or one after and then use your gun tag, too. <clears throat> you you buy three buck tags, but you can only use two of them. Oh, really? Oh, so yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. You can only kill two bucks. Yeah. But. 
Okay. You still get two. Yeah. You so if you don't kill one with a rifle during gun season, you can still kill another. Yes. Yep. Another you can one kill happened. two after. Can you, can. you can kill two the same day after. Yep. No, well, right on. Yeah, and then the other that one, if you things. if you shoot one early and then shoot one during rifle season, it turns into a antlerless permit. Yes. No, okay. Correct. So we can kill three deer this year unless you want to buy a bunch of mm-hmm. gun tags. But if you kill a doe after the rut, you're like killing two deer. Or and three. So two maybe three, four. You yeah. shouldn't do that. Right, Bob? <laughs> Here we I, go again. You need to be on live right then. You just I got, used to you like just you. got the death look. Uh, I'm sorry I made that pecker net comment <laughs> last time. <laughs> I, no, I'm not sorry. So. You're not? Okay. All right. So anyway, well, we did that. I did that, and then uh, I worked on my rest on my target bow a little bit, and that was about it. Well, I went up and checked trail cameras, and I found out when I was at Josiah's makeup soccer game last Sunday that a nice eight-pointer decided to walk by the stand <laughs> in broad daylight. He'd and, have been uh, bigger next year, according yeah. to Bob. And then, so and we got older. excited about that. We were going to go up and hunt, and then a family's, my wife's aunt's dad died, and his visitation is tomorrow night, and his funeral is Saturday. So... Well, he probably didn't know that you wanted to hunt. I know. <laughs> very <laughs> so, very yeah. inconsiderate, to be honest with you. But um, tonight we're here with Doug Hutchison, and we're going to find out what he's been doing in archery lately. And uh, one thing he's been doing is he's been out elk hunting. Welcome, Doug. Thanks. Thanks for having me. So um, where did you go hunting at? Uh, New Mexico, in northern New Mexico in the wilderness area. Is that one you had to draw? Yeah, it, it takes – I've put in for – I think 22 years now, and I've drawn twice. Really? Yeah. And this one, ultimately, <laughs> I didn't draw this year. I ended up buying a voucher so I could from a landowner so I could go. I see. Um, so was why I would never do it. Finally got tired of it and just <laughs> <laughs> broke down and, and pulled the trigger because it's an area that I know. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not a high-quality area. Um, but there are a lot of bulls and I know it's some, New Mexico. So yeah. And there are some areas where you can get away from people because it's a wilderness area. It's hard to access. Right. But once you're in there, I never saw another person and the bulls were working. Did wow. you know the wow. landowner? Um, no, I, I went through a broker. He owns a bow shop and. So that voucher allowed you to walk across his land to get to the wilderness. The area voucher or? allows me to purchase an elk license. I see. That's all. And I you mean, didn't have to hunt on his land. No. I could. Now, there are two different kinds. There's a ranch only, and then there's a unit wide. And I wanted to make sure I got a unit wide because I wanted to hunt public land in this wilderness area. I did notice so. that you took the wuss way out this year. Didn't blow your Achilles out. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, no, no crutches on this elk hunt. Sure, probably it was made nice. it a lot easier. Yeah, it made it a lot easier. On, I mean, your arm wasn't in a cast. No, no, it was close because my son decided to separate my shoulder about six weeks before I left. Oh really? man! Yeah, we just got back from vacation, and long story short, when you got a three hundred pound, fifteen year old, and he's an offensive lineman, and you were a defensive lineman, don't make smart mouth comments. <laughs> 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 because no, really. I, I thought the, the deal was over, and I got past him a couple times. I and, we had to talk about this. And I was going to pick up his truck that we just got for him and went to go around him, and he grabbed my arm, and next thing I know, it's out of socket, and it hurt. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm thinking, I just got this tag, and, oh, I could have killed him. But... <laughs> Yeah. Did he feel so, bad? Oh, you thought he shot me. I really? mean, literally, he was, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, he felt so bad it kind of made me mad. I'm like, dude, it, it just happened. Just yeah. Did he grab it and put it what? back? Oh, Did he, he put was, it back in for you? No, it popped. It slid back in yeah. fairly quick. It, it wasn't too bad. And that That is a worst pain ever, too, man. I did it in high school and during a football game, and I went ahead and played two more quarters, and it was the dumbest thing I ever, you know, one of those. Yep thought i was being tough and <laughs> stupid yes it was yeah. why well, don't I have a feeling other than that though if you told him to do something he jumps right up and does it for you oh yeah, pretty <laughs> much yeah. he's, he's a good kid so is this a backpack hunt yes um actually a, a good friend of mine dennis howell um he's a best hunter i've ever been around he's just a great guy um i helped him last year in arizona and also on his mountain goat hunt in colorado 
and he felt like he kind of owed me. My my plan whenever I got the tag was to do it totally backpack by myself. Um, he was kind of in between hunts, and he's got some mules, so we got them registered and took them down there and used the mules to get stuff back in there, and then it was really nice once the elk's down to, to get stuff out. So. so. So when you say you got them registered, what you have to register them in the state? Or? In, in certain states, they have different rules. You got to have them checked for certain diseases and things like that. It's you just draw blood. Is that what? <laughs> draw blood, do a couple different things, yeah. and you know, like Colorado, you got to use certain hay if you're taking hay and different things. But New Mexico, you do have to have them. You have to have a permit, and if you don't, they seize your mules and. They, it's a thousand dollar a piece fine yeah. and wow. things like that. And I heard something it gets about that. Ugly. Yeah. yeah. So, note to the wise: if you're going to take stock to any state, check the regulations. Yeah. But even in Colorado, they you have to buy their hay basically, but the mule's still crapping on the trail. <laughs> so tell me that with the hay he ate here in Missouri. <laughs> so it's a wonder. Don't know. don't say that because they'll probably make you buy hay a month ahead of the time. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, quarantine them or something. Yeah, something. Because that whole deal is they're just trying to prevent noxious weeds, right? Yeah. So. Yeah. So, um, but ultimately we we packed in and got set up. We were back in the wilderness area. We were probably five miles back in, and then from there, once you get on top in this area, it's pretty easy traveling after that. And about a little over ten thousand foot. Um, got into bulls every day. Was there? Made it a, a fairly short hunt. Um, once again, I wanted to make sure I got back for my son's next football game and, right. and things like that. But um, got lucky. Got into bulls from day one, and they were they were working pretty good. They were shutting off fairly early, um, but were still vocal and would come. Um, got in the first day. Got on a few. Um, had one bust me on the wind. He sounded like a really good bull, and he was close. I never got to lay eyes on him. But that evening, um, I think I could have shot four different bulls wow. that evening. Um, had a couple of real close encounters. And then the next morning, it was going really good. And ultimately, got in on the one that I shot and shot him at 15 yards. Second, close enough, I didn't second have to worry day? About it. Yeah, second day. Wow. So, yeah. so when that bull busted you, did he completely leave the country? or He just took off. I mean, he, he disappeared. I didn't see him. He, was, he came in hot and heavy. We knew the wind was iffy. It would be going really good at, at one point. And then we cow called, and he came running. You know, he cut 200 yards in no time and was just screaming. And he had a real throaty bugle. Sounded like a, a really good bull. Um, but where we were at, we were kind of in a bowl, and it was swirling. And he got down. He was within 50, 60 yards probably, but I couldn't see him because of the brush. And everything just went. It went from really going to dead silent, never heard another peep. You knew he he caught our wind. Wow. But how do, how do they get out of there without making any noise when they? Get I don't out? know when they when they're coming. Sometimes they they sound like a whole herd, just one of them, and then they can be like a church mouse. Yeah. It's it's amazing how an animal that size with those horns. If you're in the dark timber, which is where we were at, we were in some really nasty blowdowns and and things like that, um, which is where a lot of times they like to bed up. But that's where he was coming through, and when he was coming, you could hear him. I mean, you could hear it like a Mack truck was driving through it. But as soon as he didn't want to be heard, not even a branch hardly. Wow. Wow. <laughs> that is amazing. Yep. And, a, and a moose will do the same thing. I've I've been up in the Yukon, and you know, these animals are <laughs> they're like a Mack truck coming through. And when they don't care, they'll break every branch and make all kinds of noise. And once they know something's up, they slip out, and you never know they're gone. So when when you went in, how long did it take you to find the elk? Um, I got lucky. Um, we found them. This is a unit that I'd hunted, I think, three years before, and that's I really wanted to get back in there. It was just, it's a really cool country and a lot of elk. Um, I've yet to see a, a giant bull in there, but I've shot enough of them. I'm not so worried about how big they are. It's the experience, and I love the the backpack area. You know, to get away from people. Mm-hmm. Um, and the bulls are vocal that time of year. And we were in them. You know, I got in there a day early to, to try to find them, and we had elk within 200 yards of camp. Matter of fact, that first night when we were coming back, it was almost a full moon. But as we were coming back, we were in the moonlight, and there was a meadow to get to camp. 
and we saw two bulls out out in the meadow just screaming at each other, you know, 150, 200 yards away from each other. It was really a cool picture. Right. So. Huh. So did you go in and set up camp right away, or did you – I, yeah, you well, set up camp I, first before you found the bulls, or I I knew about where they were going to be, and from where we were at, I knew within probably two miles in any direction I was going to be able to find them. There's yeah. a couple big ridges and one drainage that I knew I wanted to hunt, and where we were at was kind of centrally located, so I could go pretty much north, south, and east really easy and get in on them. So um, that's where we. We set up. There's good water source and stuff there. Yeah. So, and a a good place to kind of hide camp so nobody knows we're there. If somebody did come down the main trails, right, they wouldn't know we were there. So, how far did you have to go hike to get into the elk every day? I mean, literally, we had elk within a few hundred yards of camp at times. Um, Where I ultimately shot my bull was a little over a mile away. Yeah. Um, And we were on four different bulls that morning. Worked one pretty good, but he was he was moving off, and he didn't sound overly impressive, so we didn't chase him. Um, and then we got in on another one. Well, there were three bulls in this area, and they were hammering pretty good. I had a bull real close. I couldn't see him. Um, ultimately, he moved off, and I'm, I'm guessing he had cows with him. And then made, a, made another adjustment, got in a little bit closer, did some calling, and was about ready to leave the setup and notice some movement. And three cows came up within, from me to you, literally, you know, three, three yards, yards, three yards from me. And a five by six bull was right behind him. Wow. Uh, or right behind the, the cows pushing them. And, and he would have been a 10 yard chip yeah. shot. And once that was gone, um, Heard another bull bugling, so we dropped some elevation and started climbing and then heard the throaty bull that we heard earlier that morning kind of back in the general area across a little drainage. You know, it wasn't very deep, just a you know, a couple hundred foot drop. So I ended up going after him, and ultimately that was a bull I shot. Yeah. And it, it was an older bull. I mean, he had, you know, his, his back end wasn't real long. Not that I was worried about that. It was just exciting how he came in and worked and was talking and – when you get a bull screaming at 15 yards, it's always, oh yeah, <laughs> you know, exp- and at first I wasn't going to shoot him. And then I'm like, you know, this is a gift right here. Right. Yeah. And it was such a beautiful picture and, you know, he didn't go anywhere. Um, kind of a cool story about the bull. Whenever we were quartering him up and boning him out, there was a broadhead that was at least two years old. It was all grown over. Really? Lodged into his shoulder blade. Wow. So what kind? Hey, I got a quick question. When you're shooting one, <laughs> let's say you were. 10 yards away like you were talking a second mm-hmm. ago what pin would you use on that um at that close and everybody's different um it, it all depends on where your peep is in reference to the arrow so everybody's a little bit different at that close on that big of an animal i'm going to aim at the bottom third and put my 25 yard pin right on it and i'm going to okay. drill him um if it was a, a little bit closer like cut that distance in half i'd probably use my 45 yard pin okay. but i do practice that you know from from two yards because of the 20 plus bulls i've shot i average under 20 yards i wow. mean it just you know, i've shot a couple at some distances to to bring that up but the majority of them are honestly 15 and under yeah well, we were practicing that in, in jack's backyard using a using a uh, glendale buck and i was at what three or five yards something like that i was using basically 35 to 37 yard pin yeah, that and, was and right. you know, on, a, on an elk, the, as big as their kill zone and everything is, if you aim the middle, <laughs> you're, <laughs> you're killing them. Um, but I do practice it for shooting 3Ds and things like that. And I, when you're real picky, actually the shot that I made on this bull, it was good to know because there was a little bit of brush and I had a hole. I had to, to lace it through a hole to get to him. And if I would have aimed, you know, like, say, center 10 on an elk target – I wouldn't have killed. I would have hit brush, but I had to aim to the bottom third, and I knew the trajectory of my arrow to to be able to make the shot. Wow! Um, but it it zipped right to him, and he yeah. didn't go. Doug sounds like else. he shot his bow a few times. <laughs> kind of knows all this stuff. Yeah, it's kind of weird. Well, it's, I've, <laughs> I've had people tell me that that sometimes they you know when they got they've got the wind right, so the wind's coming from the bull to them that they actually smell the bull before they see him. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. You can. Smell, I, matter of fact, I've smelt them from. 
a long ways away. Or when I say a long ways, 60 to 100 yards. So yeah. the wind's right, and they're really running hard, and they've been rolling. And this one was a fairly stinky bull, but he had, you know, he didn't have signs of just wallowing. But man, they can they can reek. And a moose, like up in the Yukon, you can smell them from a quarter mile away. Really? When, when it's that time, <laughs> they they're real funky. Yeah. Well, kinda, you remember how bad like Bob, you can hear the bullshit before you can see. Him. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. I was just getting ready to say I I can usually smell you from forty or fifty yards away too. Well, you remember when we were up at Fred's? That, that's that's what there. it hit me when yeah. I went up to that. The, the guys that was telling me that, or some stuff that I read, they weren't they weren't just telling a story because we oh, no. we drove through the you know and the elk ran off into the timber and then we basically drove through them you know right where they were standing and yeah. uh, you could smell oh yeah you oh, walk I mean, you walk bad. where they've been and yeah. you can still smell it it's it's a pungent you know it's yeah. it's a musky <laughs> smell it stinks yeah, yeah it, there's. <laughs> But I've, I've actually ran into that with whitetail, too. You get a yeah. buck that's oh, yeah. really worked up, and I've walked into an area and just stopped and, and knew exactly what was going on and, you know, set up. Cause Back they're, out, they're close. regroup. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. What's, a, what's a comfortable shot at distance? Should you shot some at distance before? <laughs> it, I know it depends that, that's, on that's the That's a loaded question. And I, you know, I hate to, to give a number because I've put it this way. I've, I've passed up shots at less than 10 yards because it wasn't right. It was a bad angle. Um, and and I, I can argue certain, you know, I hear a lot of people say, well, there's certain shots you shouldn't ever take. And I'll disagree with them, but you got to know your abilities too. Right. And what, you know, one guy's ability doesn't always match, but the situation dictates how far I'm willing to shoot to. Um, do, do I know that if one was staying in broadside totally comfortable at 65 yards, can I make that shot? Can I hit? you know, a, a small target at that distance. Yeah. But that small target isn't so small, but it moves. Right. And it's a respect thing with the animal. I, the whole game to me is to get close. That's what gets me, you know, it's not the, the number of inches anymore. It's, it's that chase and interaction with them and getting close to them. That, that trips my trigger. Um, can you kill one at 70 yards? Sure you can. It'll zip right through it and won't even slow down. But also that elk can take one step or turn. And if they're really worked up and they're messing with cows and there's a lot of elk there, the odds of him moving in the time that you make a absolute perfect pinpoint X-ring shot, you can miss by feet, yards, because it's by the time your arrow left your bow to get to him, it's he's already moved. So, you know, it. Every situation's a little bit different. If they're totally relaxed and stuff, taking that type of a shot, I personally don't feel as unethical. But you, if you haven't practiced that shot a thousand times, you know, from a stressful situation off your knees and things like that with your pack on and your hunting clothes, then you shouldn't be shooting it. You know, if you've shot it three times in your backyard <laughs> and you, you hit the, the 3D target once, that's not smart. I'll you know, so you, so you got to know. <laughs> and, and unfortunately, I, like I said, the bull that I shot had a broadhead <clears> lodged <throat> in his shoulder. Yeah. Yeah. And the same kind of broadhead that I've killed several elk with. So I know it works. <laughs> but if you hit him in the shoulder. In, How far was he off? Honestly, less than a foot. I mean, and on an elk, that that's, right. you know, not, not very far. I mean. Literally six inches, probably. If he would have been down a little bit farther, you know, it was just a little bit high and it was close to the ridge. And I think if he just would have hit the flat part. Um, but then again, the elk could have been turning because he was spooky or anything that can rob energy from your arrow. Yeah. One way or the other, it didn't go through the shoulder and and it was, you know, scar tissued over it. Matter of fact, it took me 10 minutes to dig it out of the scar wow. tissue to find, I just, I hit something metal and I knew what it was. Yeah. So I, and then I was curious. I had to, had to see what kind it was. And my buddy the whole time was saying, I bet it's an expandable. <laughs> and then when I pulled it out, he goes, uh, it just must've been a bad shot. Cause that's a broad head he's used for years. <laughs> nice. <laughs> So I like, kind of, I like kind of how we don't name it. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, it was a shuttle T. It was a 125-grain shuttle T. I still got it. Yeah. And I've killed a number of animals and a number of elk with it. And it's a great broadhead. And But at the end of the day, you you better be shooting a strong broadhead, and it held up just fine. It, it wasn't a broadhead failure. It was a shot placement issue. And 
who knows? It could have hit a branch, could have anything. Could have been shooting it from yeah. way too far, too. Could have been shooting from way too far, could have been excited and got his arm into the bowstring, could have, who knows? Yeah. I, but it's one of those deals that, you know, whenever I dug it out, you, I've thought about that a number of times, wondering what the story was. Was there any arrow attached to it at all? No, it actually backed all the way out. The insert was gone, um, just the, the broad head itself. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And that would have been so. two years ago. wonder what that bull would have been then. Not a very big bull? or No, actually, I, I think the bull was on the way down. His teeth were really it? worn. His bases are real good. Um, he was missing one of his ivories. He, he was an older bull, for sure. So He looked pretty good, though. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I knew. <laughs> I, I pretty much knew what he was when I shot him. And, you know, my buddy, he was telling me he, he gets – he gets excited <laughs> because he's a monster. I go, no. <laughs> but but I was really happy to take him. And like I said, anymore, it's not as much how big they are. It, it's the experience. Yeah. And and it, it was a fun, fun hunt. And when you get them to come in close like that and stuff. And I already had numerous encounters, you know, in just a short amount of time. And. So had you moved in on them? Had you heard them bugling and you moved in? Yeah, actually, he only bugled about two times. Um, like I said, we we were in on the one that came in with the cows, but there were three bulls in that area. And on the other side, there was a basically a creek, and then up on another hillside, we had heard a bull bugling. He didn't sound that big, but it was the only one we were hearing at that time, so we went off after him. And we dropped down, started climbing up. We were about halfway up and heard this one bugle back closer to where we had just came from, within 400 yards or so. So we, and he, he sounded definitely like a mature bull or it, it's hard to tell, but you can. So do you get to him quick? How, I mean, are you going quiet I, or are you just going to go on to that him? on that time? Every, every situation's a little bit different. You know, sometimes you got to cover ground, you got to listen to what they're saying he sounded like he was worked up pretty good he went from being totally quiet to all because he hadn't bugled in probably 45 minutes to an hour and whenever we were going after the one bull you know where we dropped down and started climbing up when he fired off i figured a smaller bull that either came in and he had a cow with him and you could tell just in the tone of his voice he got a little more aggressive Mm -hmm. and we didn't call from that point, we just cut distance, and I got in. I knew there was a meadow up on top of the hill, which I was guessing where he was at. Got on that edge and saw him working and set up, and, and he ended up coming right right to me. Oh, I see. So, so where was I going to go with this? <laughs> well, I'll, Doug, his normal question. He was Man, shaking. Every, you know, everything what? that was in your pack. Everything, Tell everything, us everything yeah. that was in That's your That's where I'm, I'm going to go to that. <laughs> you know I am. You guys can I go, you go outside if you want. Did you notice <laughs> yeah, when you, you – I noticed when you were saying talk, – talking about the jack start shaking over there. You said, <laughs> you said camp. I could feel the floor <laughs> shaking over here. I'm like, here it comes. Did you bugle at them? Or did you mostly just cow call or how did e- – Everyone's different. Thing? It's, you know, um, the night before um, when I got into a, a group of four bulls um, – my buddy was staying back, and we got somewhat close, but we actually separated because I needed to go and and cut some distance. And he was staying back and bugling and cow calling periodically just to keep the the tension going, you know, to keep the other elk talking. And that allowed me, which was worth its weight in gold. He he wasn't calling them to to me, but. Just, just them sounding them. off, I knew where to go. And then it helps me because then I can play the wind better and things like that. Because when you set up, just especially if it's an older bull, they have a tendency. They want to get downwind of you. They want to smell you before they come in. And usually that's how, you know, 50% of them, you know, why you don't get a shot is because they will work their way around downwind when he was that far away they felt comfortable to talk i could cut distance and once i got in on them you know i did some cow calls but there were plenty of cows around when i was challenging with my bugles they were come running in you know and that that's when it's i love to bugle i don't do it near as much as my buddy dennis does you know he's Mm -hmm. he's a phenomenal elk caller um it's fun to bugle you know hunting in states like arizona where the bull to cow ratio i've had better luck in arizona bugling bulls than i have cow calling at times 
Um, every situation is different. And so do you bugle, bugle and move? Um, not always. It it just depends on what the terrain is. If it's wide open and stuff, if they can see, you know, if you're on in a park, you probably better cut some distance because they they can pinpoint it. It's scary how <laughs> they can come right to the tree that you're at. Mm-hmm. But if it's broken up and you're in the darker timber, you don't have to quite as much because they can't see. But if you're in a, an open area and you're just trying to call and they can't have that visual, they'll get to a certain point. They'll look and they'll wait. And if they don't see it, it's kind of like turkey hunting. Yeah, that's what it, I was going to say. Yeah. You know, I, I had a guy, his name was Dallas James, one of the neatest individuals I've ever met in my life. I met him down in Springfield area and he was an older gentleman, worked at the, he lived in Branson, but in the Springs, he would go out to, to Colorado and work in the wilderness areas and clear the trails. So he lived with the elk for four to five months out of the year. Um, you know, he, he would tell me, it's just like turkey hunting. If you can kill a turkey, you can kill an elk, but you better play the wind. And if you learn, it, the guys that are good turkey hunters, they may be able to make all the calls, but they know when to make that call. And if you try to pinpoint them, well, why, why did you do that? They usually tell you, well, because this is what I thought he was saying. Elk hunting is the same way. If you listen to what they're saying and what they're doing, because they're, you know, some guys hear a bugle and they think, well, that's a bugle. Well, there's about six different versions of a bugle. You know, he's saying different things. So the more you learn about that, you don't have to be the best caller. But if you know that language, it's a whole lot easier to get him to come in. Because I've, I've hunted with guys that can call way better than I can. But if you know what to say and what they're doing, it's a whole lot easier to get, get them to come in. And you can be a great caller. And if you're not in the spot where that bull or turkey wants to come. It's not going to happen. He's not going to come. Mark Drury, yeah. a friend of mine. <laughs> he, he's a world champion. One of the, you know, Chris Parrish, who is a phenomenal turkey caller will sit there and tell you he's told me on a number of occasions mark is the best turkey caller he's ever heard and and i would i would agree with that and he'll say you can't make them do something they don't want to do if they're going over there you can sit there and have mark in your back pocket calling and that bird's still going to go over there i can go around and not call that great (laughs) or call, (laughs) call okay but not near as good as a guy was just sitting by and that bird will come to me because that's the direction he wanted to go yep speaking of juries you got a good shout out the other day i was watching a facebook video terry was talking about you having to send you his oh carbon air yeah yeah they're great guys they're a good friend of mine and thank the world of them they're they're the real deal you you meet enough of these guys and some of them are in it for the wrong reasons and i won't really get into all that i can tell you want you to name names no no, i i I won't um but but i will tell you that mark and terry our podcast listeners will go up by several thousand if you will name names right now (laughs) mark and terry are, are the real deal they're they're great guys you know Still, still work. Terry still runs a construction company, and you know they're just real guys that love to hunt, hmm. and they're they're trying to do it right. Yeah. You know, that time you introduced me to them down there, at Cabela's, they were just they were really cool, man. They yeah, like, they're just, they're just real guys, just dudes, man. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Mark was a sales rep, and Terry's a construction guy. So, and they've, they've they got it figured way. out. Yep. Do so they're still now. working after all the success with their show and everything, huh? Oh yeah. Wow. Yep. Yeah, Terry still runs a crew out of Bloomsdale. And yeah. Huh. Does he Works. still get dirty, or does he just run the crew? <laughs> <laughs> How many guys that age do you know still get too I dirty? I think I know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> is, is he afraid to get dirty? I'll, I'll answer that without a doubt, no. No, that but, wasn't the question at but, all. It was more of a, <laughs> a construction supervisor or yeah, still he's, working. Yeah, he's a supervisor now. But, and well, runs I'm the doing crews. something wrong. I'm still working. <laughs> well, it's just it, yeah. <laughs> you know, but. I sat around with a radio so all day. On a lot I'm of tired these, when I get home. On a lot of these hunting shows, these elk shows, mm-hmm. it seems like the guys are just standing right out in the open, and the elk walk up to them and don't don't act like they can even see them. <laughs> you know, and, and I've heard they they talk about not getting yourself caught behind a tree to get in front of the tree and stuff. What do you think about all that? I, I think that's that's true. Um, you you need cover, but it's not quite like what most people would think. Most people think cover is hiding behind something. Um, movement's the key. They're going to pick up movement just like a lot of animals. You know, a, a turkey's a little different. They can see detail. 
and they can, you know, they see you blink your eyes sometimes, and and they can get twitchy. Where, you know, an elk's not; they're looking for an elk. If, once they believe, you know, if your calling is convincing enough, when they come in, they're not necessarily looking for a person; they're looking for an elk. They're they're excited and they're, you know, looking for that. Um, last year in Arizona, my buddy Dennis, the best bull we saw in Arizona, I got in behind him we got a bull working and i backed off he was our game plan was he was going to drop down a little bit farther than where he ultimately made it because the bull started cutting some distance he set up behind a bush and this guy's killed 30 bulls and some giants and (laughs) is as good of an elk hunter as anybody you'll ever meet he knew better but he set up behind a bush and that bull, I was still thinking where I was bringing, because I could see the bull, but I couldn't see Dennis because there was just enough of a, I could see the bull's rack. And he was 380s, wow. he was a giant, yeah. came in to four yards screaming and started tearing up the brush that he was hiding behind, oh my and gosh. he couldn't shoot. <laughs> yeah. And now, if I would have known where Dennis was at, I would have moved my position a little bit and called the bull, and he would have came beside him but he was coming straight in line and yeah. it just you know miscommunication he didn't go where he was supposed to if he's listening <laughs> um, we'll, we argue about that yeah. but <laughs> or give each other crap about it but um i i prefer to to get in front of something as long as i've got some back cover or some cover say 20 yards in front of me that that's all i need you know, and you can move a little bit more with elk and things. You better know when to draw and when not to. Um, you got to kind of read their temperature. It's kind of no different, really, than sitting up in a tree stand when a whitetail comes in. You can't just yank it back every, you know, as soon as he gives you that perfect shot if he's looking a certain way. Mm-hmm. You got to read the situation. And that you can watch all TV you want and let it be known that not all of them, but the majority of those elk hunts you're watching are on private ranches, big ranches where the hunting pressure is next to none, and it's just it's a different animal, right? Than than say a Colorado over the counter tag area. What if somebody's always dreamed about going elk hunting? Go. How how? <laughs> it, it, it seems. I mean, it seems like it's overwhelming. So where would they? How would you get started? But back, you know, I mentioned Dallas James earlier. I was in my early 20s, and I'd been out west. I'd hunted antelope and mule deer and things like that and black bear um, and some stuff out on my own. But I, I understand exactly what you're saying because it overwhelmed me too. It it intimidated me to some extent. I'm not too proud to say it. I was I was nervous, and I, I let that hold me back from going for a little while, and I started talking to Dallas in the archery shop one day, and he kind of laughed. He goes, you're killing all these turkeys with a bow. And that was 20 years ago. Nobody was bow hunting turkeys hardly, it, you know, and it was before blinds and things. And he goes, if you're doing that, you should be elk hunting. I know you want to go. Why don't you go? And I always use the excuse, well, I, I can't afford it. Because I was thinking the only way I would get one would be hire an outfitter and, and go that route. And I just didn't have the money or really didn't want to pay for it, to be honest, you know. Um, he He told me, if you get if you've got the grit to do it and you hunt smart you'll kill an elk he goes it's not going to be easy but if you want one bad enough you'll do it and that year i invested in a tent i wish i would have invested in a better pair of boots i got a sleeping bag that i um i had to retire my tent last year it was over 20 years old it finally had a pole break on it the tent part was still good i bought a good tent but eventually i broke a pole my sleeping bag i still use today you know I've upgraded some things, but a lot of the stuff I've still got from over well over 20 years ago. And with that, I've gone out and I've killed elk pretty much every time. And I've gone to multiple states and killed multiple bulls in the same year. And at the end of the day, it's you've got to have some woodsmanship. I think, you know, a lot of people anymore, they, they watch so much TV and it looks easy. And that's something that I think gets lost mm-hmm. um, in our society. If you can't read about it and if you can't see it on you know, the iPhone, it, you, you're not going to learn it. Well, get out in the woods and just be there, and you will figure it out if you pay attention. You know, if you go with a purpose, mm-hmm. you can't just walk around in the woods and expect to absorb it. But if you start paying attention, you're going to learn. So if you buy good good equipment, 
start talking to people that know, learn how to talk to the biologists and the game wardens and things like that. They're will they help you out? Yeah, they will. But like a lot of things, if you call up and just say, where can I go to kill an elk? They're probably not going to tell you a whole lot. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're not because they're you didn't put any effort into it, so they're not going to give you any effort back. But I've I've talked to dozens of great guys in every state where I draw a tag and I, I get maps of areas and I start narrowing it down and you don't have to know a whole lot. If you just got a map in front of you and you can name a couple drainages, Hey, can you tell me, or, you know, is there some, some elk, do they winter in there? You know, or will they be in there in September? They'll tell you a lot of information. You can find out about grazing permits because a lot of times there's cattle, you know, on BLM ground or National Forest ground in Colorado. If there's a ton of cattle, it can mess it up. I know in Idaho one year I got into an area that I'd killed a couple elk and went back, and the next year there was a bunch of sheep. I would have given $100 to have known that there were sheep in there because they ate everything and there wasn't an elk within miles. <laughs> You know, but if I would have made the phone call, I got lazy and I didn't make the call, right. so I had to go to my plan B. And every time I go, I will have a plan A, B, C, D, you know, several, several different ideas of what I need to do just in case one doesn't pan out. Sometimes, guys, you know, I talk to What are to you guys, looking for on that? You know, I'm looking because, for I mean, Colorado is a big state or Colorado is a big state. Um, there are certain areas that are going to hold more elk. I personally, I love the wilderness areas because that usually cuts a lot of people out. Because <laughs> if they can't ride their four-wheelers, they're not going to walk and they're not going to get back in there. Um, I'm looking for drainages that don't have a lot of trails around them, in them, through them. I'm looking for food, water, and cover. If they've got, if those three things are present in an area, you know, if we're talking eastern plains, yeah, there's not elk. <laughs> they they can have those things. But if there are elk in that general area, if I can find food, cover, and water, I'm going to find elk. What are you, are looking, you looking for food-wise? Food-wise, just grass, you know. Like same thing. That, that how can cattle. you tell by looking at a map? Are you looking at Google Earth or what? I'm looking at Google food? Earth now. I mean, 20 years ago, there wasn't Google Earth. So what but I was you're looking doing, for meadows and stuff like that. I was like looking that. for meadows and things like that. You can look on the maps, and if you know how to read them, you can also see what – you know, where the, the darker timber is, where the meadows are because of the coloration and things like that. Yeah. So, What about water? Are you looking for streams? Are you looking for lakes or both? Or? It's got to have some source of water because I've been in areas where it was a dry year and the, the creek was dried up and the springs weren't as good. If you know where springs are at, that's – I think elk tend to like to – Whoops, sorry. To, to be in that kind of water. You know, big lakes, it's water, but – I, I didn't see a, a ton of elk water in there. They prefer, like this area that I was just in, there were a lot of seeps and stuff like that. There there was a creek, but there were seeps back in there, and that makes the grass grow taller, and it was around a lot of cover, so the elk were just really in it good. What about breaking one down and getting it out? I think that's probably what's intimidating to a lot of people, too. I mean, you had You, you better have time, a plan, but, uh, and that's just it, you know. Have you ever, like, called ahead and had, like, an outfitter? Yes. Yes, I have. And actually, on, will pack out for you, right? on this deal, um, I'd already lined up with a guy 20 years ago before I blew up my Achilles. <laughs> you know, even a few years ago, I, I wouldn't have had a problem packing the bull. Where I shot him, I could have packed him out. Because mm -hmm. um, it wasn't real bad terrain, and literally from there, it had been a long trek, but it was pretty much downhill, pretty easy walking. Um, now I, I really don't want to have to do that. It's it's going to hurt me more. Yeah. Um, I'd already lined up with an outfitter, you know, a, a set feed. If I quartered it up and got it to the main trail, he would come into the wilderness area and pack it out. And that fee he said he'd do it for three hundred dollars, and it would have been yeah. worth the three hundred bucks to me. Oh yeah. Um, oh yeah. Matter of fact, it would have been cheaper to do that instead of helping, you know, pay for the permits to get my buddy to bring his mules across from Colorado into there. They cost that much? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's no joke. And and if you don't, don't have them, you know, I, I try yeah. to do everything as up and up as you can get. So right. I went ahead yep. and took care of it. But um, you better have a plan. You know, if you're by yourself, and I, I have packed out a number of the majority of the bulls I've shot, I've packed out by myself, and it can be done. But you better practice it. You better know what how to load a pack, how to carry the weight, and probably should you be using some trekking poles and things like that. If you're not in shape, be honest with yourself. Because once it's down, 
if you're not honest with yourself, you've now done everything a disjustice and you're breaking the law too. You know, wanting waste is, is no joke. Right. Um, you better, better have a plan, whether it's having friends that can come help you, having an outfitter lined up to where he comes in or stock to, to get him out. You know, my buddy, he loves his mules like they're his kids. Um, and, and I see that, but honestly, I would just soon not have them around until an elk's dead. And then yeah. they're great. Yeah. I can carry everything I need in and I can carry all my stuff out. But once an elk's down, it's sure nice to, you know, we put all the meat on the mules. I throw on my pack and load it up and straight out. And within, you know, five or six hours, we're done. What, what do you, what can you leave? Like where you were, what can you leave of the elk? Um, just, the, just the, we quarter them up. Um, I do the gutless method. I don't know how much you know about that. You know, I basically the elk, they're so big. And when you're by yourself, especially, you know, there's no move. It's not like a whitetail where you can just pull it around and reposition it and everything. You're kind of at the mercy of where they fall. And I'll take the hide off the back quarter, take that quarter off. Um, I lay out a piece of plastic sheeting, just a drop cloth. they like 99 cent at Walmart mm -hmm. for painting drop cloth, just thin plastic. I lay that out and then I can put the quarter on that so it's not getting dirty and nasty because it's peeled off. Then I'll bone it out, put it in a game sack and hang it up. So you do bone it all out? Yes, I bone it out. Um, so you, if, you if can leave the carcass? Yeah, you can leave the carcass. Okay. Sure. Yeah. And I take out the quarters, the back straps, I take out the inner loins and then take some neck meat. And, I, I usually don't mess with the ribs. I've I've had them. I've cut them out, depending on where I'm at. But usually, if I'm way back in there, by the time the, the ribs get out, they've dried enough that they don't taste very good. So, it, hmm. you know, when I'm in Alaska or Yukon or somewhere like that, you got to take it all. <laughs> there's, really? I mean, it looks like when, I, when you're done with them, it looks like the buzzards of our – there's not – the buzzards are mad at you because there's wow. nothing left. Um but with an elk, you know, I'll, I'll take the quarters. I take everything that's that's good and edible. You know, I, I take the quarters, bone it out, um, back straps, loins, and neck meat. Is it your favorite meat? Um, I, there's a lot of doll sheep's pretty hard to beat. Really? <laughs> yeah, it's it's. Well, we'll never know. It's that. really <laughs> good. Um, honestly, at the end of the day, it, it sounds crazy, but coos whitetail, cows, however you want to pronounce, I call them coos deer. That's phenomenal meat. It, it's unreal good. Elk, I love it. Um, moose is good. I've had some caribou that was phenomenal. I've shot another caribou that was running really hard, but I don't know that I'd fed it to a dog. <laughs> <laughs> Which so, means I fed it to my dog. <laughs> yeah. and, and, you know, antelope. I've had antelope. I, I'll eat my antelope, and I love it. But I don't know that I'll go eat somebody else's if they invite me to come over because most people don't get the hide off quick enough. And as you know, you guys have oh, shot them. Yep. That hide is, the hair is so thick and it's hollow, it's an insulator. And mm -hmm. if you don't get it off quick, that meat gets gamey. It's yeah. less, it's than an hour, less than an hour. Yeah. Usually it. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm taking Fred's, it off. Well, quick. hour, hour and a half at the most. Yeah. Yeah. But and it's those great. Those guys meat, were amazing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's fantastic. Yeah. Ours is good. I could. I felt like my I made some hamburger the other day and I felt like it was a little I, I would describe it as sagey tasting. Yeah. And but the steaks and everything have been yeah. excellent. Yep. The so. best the best meat I've ever ate in my life was was elk meat. It was the rib meat. We'd been up in the mountains for <laughs> but you were starving five yeah. or six days. <laughs> there was all the fish had, had been winter killed out of this oyster lake there uh -huh. in Colorado. And uh, we hadn't had any meat for about five days, except for porcupine. Yeah. And uh, made a movie one of the boys killed Jeremiah one, and we Johnson. packed it back, and we <laughs> sat around almost all day and just ate. And uh, it was it was fantastic. <laughs> you know, Cooking it with a stick over an open fire, it was great. The, the last time I was in the same area in New Mexico, I, I shot a bull, and we did that. We, we cooked elk over open flame and stuff. And this year, whenever I shot the one that I did, it was it was early enough in the day. We knew we could get out and be back at the, tra the trailhead and the trucks and stuff and get everything loaded up before dark or right at dark if we got a hustle on. And I could tell that my buddy Dennis was torn because part of him wanted to do that again. Yeah. You know, because there's something about having a campfire. Because when I'm camping and hunting, 
I usually don't start a fire, you know, unless I'm cold and wet. You know, if I need one, I'll, I'll start one, but I don't just burn one every night because I don't want to educate because we had elk, like I said, within 100 yards camp. Um, so I try not to, to let them know that I'm in the area. Um, but there's something about a, a campfire up in the mountains when the elk are bugling and you're grilling an elk steak. And my buddy Dennis carried in a little fifth of a pint of fireball. And <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty so. sure Doug's tougher than we are. Yeah. <laughs> We grilled the back of the truck because it's good. <laughs> <laughs> but, but no, it's, it's back to your question earlier of what should a person do? Know your limitations and prepare for it and know who you are and what, if, if you're a independent person and you've got some, some knowledge, I think you're money ahead and you're going to enjoy the experience if you're a very independent person to get the stuff and learn it and go and then by yourself by yourself or with a friend i think where a lot of people mess up is they take big groups and it sounds great and it's a fun camping trip but it's not it's never a good elk killing trip it's just right you're you're messing up the whole area and it's it's hard to do when there's a group but one other guy maybe two other guys if they're the right people and you will know whether they're the right people within a few days. <laughs> Cause yeah, Get pretty into it. It, it's, it's like picking a wife. It's no joke. Dennis and I joke about it because we're to the point now I'd given up hunting with anybody else. And I was pretty much going to just do it all on my own. Cause I was tired of always being the guide and guys not wanting to pull their weight. Mm-hmm. Um, my buddy Dennis, he's 59. He's going to turn 60 here before too long. Toughest man you'll ever meet. He doesn't look like Cameron Haynes. He's not a a runner or anything like that, but he's an old bull rider. He's tough as nails. He's country boy tough. He That's is. Yeah. He, you know, he <laughs> he works his butt off at everything he does. I never have to wonder whether he's pulling his weight, and he don't have to with me either. We're, it's a team, and if it's raining, cold, nasty, and the elk aren't bugling, I know it. He knows it. There's no sense in sitting around bitching about it because mm-hmm. it don't do no good. What are we going to do to fix it? Or, you know, I've never in the 10 plus years we've been hunting together now uh, in all kinds of hunts, I've never heard him really complain or gripe once. Um, he's not the fastest up the mountain, but I know he's going to make it up the mountain. Right. Now, is, is there a difference? And you said you got tired of going with people, so you had to guide and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Is there a difference in taking somebody that does just doesn't know what they're doing? And weren't completely prepared, no. and then and then you're like, okay, I could hunt with this person again because I know they're, oh, they're sure. going to know what to do next time. My my biggest thing is kind of what I just touched on. If if you're lazy and mentally weak, I I can understand if physically it's it's hard, um, but if you're a complainer, we're not going to work out. It's just okay. it's not going to happen. If if you don't know to play the win, I'm not going to be mad at you. If you don't know how to call, we're good. But if Every night when we get back and water needs to be pumped and things need to be done and stuff like that, and because you got a headache, you're going to lay down while the other person always does the work. You know, when you're in Idaho, you better be putting your food a couple hundred yards away from you because of grizzly bears. If I'm always the one having to walk in the dark to go, which I'm fine with, I don't mind doing it. But while I'm doing that, maybe pump the water, maybe do do your share and everything's got to get done and if one person always does it one or two nights if you're <laughs> sick if you're not feeling good hey i'm i understand i don't mind doing it but don't expect me to have to do it every time because you're a baby yeah right you know and, and that's where a good partner you never have to ask them to do something because everybody pulls their own way Bob, yeah. we found our food retrieval guy. <laughs> no as long as we know how Speaking to get out we'll yeah. be right. gun or gun or bear spray uh, or both. How proficient are you with a gun? How big of a gun and things like that? Yeah. I Honestly, I think bear spray is probably your best bet to, to walk out of the situation alive. Even with black bears? Especially with black bears. They're, I mean, if you're in Colorado, do you carry bear spray? I don't carry anything Never. in Colorado. I've, I've had one running in Colorado, and, and it was a tense one, but it wasn't. I never, at, at any time, I, I never felt in a serious fear for my life. Um I've been around some grizzlies. You know, a mountain grizzly is different than a brown bear. Brown bears are usually fat and happy. They're, they're extremely dangerous. You better have a healthy respect for them, but it's a little bit different. A mountain grizzly's pretty pissed. Where, <laughs> you find, where are you finding the mountain all the time. grizzlies at? Uh, like Idaho, Montana, Wyoming, okay. some yeah. places like that. Yep. And then no, British Columbia when you start getting into Canada. I see. And stuff. Yeah. Um, but but honestly, most most people, they carry the gun, and it's a, it's a peace of mind. That's probably not going to help them. 
you know, if if you're not trained and you're not proficient with that weapon, if you can't sit there and hit the the top of this cup every time, you know, several times in a row, for one, the pistol probably isn't big enough to stop a bear in its tracks just because you hit it. You got a really small target to hit it. It's moving. You're crapping your pants. You're scared to death. And the adrenaline is a hundred, and you're going to hit that moving when your life is on the line. Probably not. I mean, right. and the the bang doesn't stop them. It you know it can it can scare them, but when it's really down to that, you better be able to immobilize them or you're in trouble. Now the spray, the only thing you got to do is flip a cap and and mist it. <laughs> yeah. And and it's probably going to. You know, nothing's foolproof, but right. me driving home's not foolproof either. Right. So if somebody is worried about that, about going to Montana or something, should what would you say about grizzly bears keeping them out of the woods? Would you say you're probably not – I mean, it's probably – the chances of being attacked by a grizzly are pretty low? Pr- pretty low, um, but also you better keep a clean camp. You better have a healthy respect for the grizzly bear. Whenever you see their sign and you know they're in the area for sure – Watch what you're doing. Pay attention to the woods, and you you can tell a lot of times when they're around, the animals start acting different. Stuff. Just just be aware. Be very aware, and I have a great deal of respect for them. Whenever I was, I hunted Idaho several times, and I was right on the edge of Yellowstone, and they were trapping problem bears and putting them over there, yeah, <laughs> which is that. which is not yeah. good because then they're disoriented and mad and the first couple of years i didn't carry anything even then um oof, oof, oof. i i do going back now i would no it's not that it's just you better be keep a clean yeah. camp and stuff that's where most people get in trouble bigfoot's do you carry bigfoot spray or jack <laughs> <laughs> no, no, well that uh bud that had his daughter out there uh where we antelope hunt he has an archer shop in idaho wasn't that right? I yeah. think Idaho. Yeah, it is Idaho. And he was talking about the last three or four years, seems like there's been a lot of people that's been mauled. Yeah, it, and, it can happen. It, I mean, it, it's you better take it serious, but it's not going to keep me out of the woods. It's not something I'm afraid of. Um, he said a lot of people, so probably two or three. I, I, yeah. I okay, think, two or three over well, a couple of years. How many he people? He said it was in, two or three people he knew that like sure. the last year that were. Yeah. Got, but but I pretty sure only that many in the last several years have happened in the whole state and whether it's a small community so right yeah you know a small area how many people got killed in kansas city in the last couple of days yes, right like, watch the news right a yeah. lot of people have been shot how many people have been killed in car wrecks you know in the last six months the odds of that happening you know it can it happen but a lot of times when it does happen and i'm not saying all the time i could get mauled tomorrow or you know next year you get ball tomorrow that's gonna be yeah, a nature yeah, that, <laughs> that's gonna be a pit bull yeah <laughs> but i mean it, it can happen and it sure you better have a respect but understand what you're getting into and and know some of the preventions and it you know it's not as bad as what nobody wants to get mauled mm-hmm. but the odds of getting mauled by a pit bull here is probably higher than not to have a problem with pit bulls, but right. <laughs> it's probably higher than, <laughs> yeah, once again, treat them with respect. And What about an offensive lineman's son? Oh, man. <laughs> he no, it's is a defensive grizzly. lineman's and son. You were, yeah. you were asking about Sasquatch, and my buddy Dennis looks like Sasquatch. <laughs> <laughs> well, one looks like tripped yeah. up. <laughs> but, so how, how does somebody know when they're in, they're, ready, they're in shape to go to the mountains? You know... There's been a lot written, and I think it's because people need stuff to write about, and it is now the cool thing to write about or twerk, twerk, text, whatever, Facebook stuff about how much writing you're doing. You twerk and while you text. <laughs> <laughs> I, I My son gets mad when I call I'm it dying. twerking and everything. <laughs> but <laughs> as you know, as you all know, I'm not the social media guy. Um, but anyways... <sighs> Your mental toughness means a whole lot more to me than your physical ability. Mm-hmm. Once again, my buddy Dennis, if you, you better be putting a gun to his head to make him run two miles. It's not going to happen. Yeah, I mean he's he's a big guy, and but I've I've climbed many a mountain with him, and I've never seen him quit. Once again, he's not the fastest up, but he will always make it to the top. I've taken guys that run in marathons and do good out there and 
mentally they couldn't handle it and they never made it to the top. Yeah. They could run, you know. I think if if a guy I don't I don't care what your age is, if you just hike and practice doing what you're going to be doing out there. Running is great. I'm not going to tell you not to run and do elliptical and stuff like that. But more important is if your feet aren't tough and you don't have boots that fit, you can be the fastest guy on the mountain. But if your feet are ripped up, you're probably not going to make it to the top. You're going to mentally break down before you get there. So if you would wear your boots and go to Blue Springs Lake or any one of the hiking trails around here, Put, start out with 15, 20 pounds of water in your pack and hike for a mile one day and then work up to where you're getting a few miles in and do that three, four, five times a week leading up to your hunt, you'll be ready. Yeah. Yep. You'll be fine. What and, kind of- and work the weight up. Don't get stupid with it. I mean, before she hunts, I was putting 100 plus pounds in a pack. You're really just hurting your knees. You know, everybody's different. I, for my practice, I'll usually put about 65, 70 pounds in, and I'll hike for four or five miles several times a week, and I'll try to run some and mix it up, but I swear that the, the hiking is way more important than the running and all the other stuff. And you'll never bench press an elk. It doesn't matter how much <laughs> yeah. you can bench press because I, I see that on Facebook stuff. You know, guys are talking. And it's great. You know, if that's what motivates you to get to the gym and, and helps you, great. But I would rather take a guy that isn't in the best of shape but is mentally tough and has some wood, woodsmanship to him. That's they're going to kill what, more elk. That's what gets me in the gym. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> I can what, tell it's the hot girl in the yoga pants. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what type of boots, not brand, but what type of boots do you prefer? Like I want to know what brand you wear. The lower, like the more tennis shoe type boots, or do you like It, it the, depends on the country that you're going to. You know, if you're hunting in Arizona and stuff, that's really all you need. I know some guys that I think Randy Elmer wears tennis shoes, you know, running shoes. Um, I personally won't because I've run into enough cactus and stuff. <laughs> it hurts. Um, I wear for elk pretty much everywhere I've been like a Danner pronghorn or something like that. I, what I've been wearing for the last couple of years is a Mendel and it's a lightweight. It's similar to a, a pronghorn type boot. Pronghorn's um, hard to beat. Yeah. It, well, I first few pair that I had were great. And then I ran into about two pair in a row that fell apart and I kind of got away from them. I'm not saying I, I would have told you they were the best boot in the world. And some other guys were saying, those things are junk. And I'm like, man, I've had these for several years, and they're great. And then I bought a pair, and it barely made it through the season. And then I bought another pair, and it barely made it through the season. And I quit. Right. So, so it, it, you know, having a, a decent pair of boots, if your ankles are bad, you better get a stiffer boot, you know. Um, I personally don't like to wear a super heavy boot. My buddy Dennis, he wears Kenetrex. It helps his ankles and stuff, and, and his feet don't get as fatigued. Um, on the uneven ground. It doesn't bother me. Part of it's because I hike as much as I do getting ready for it. You know, when I'm sheep hunting, goat hunting, you know, some rougher mountains, some places in Colorado, I'm wearing a heavier, once again, Mendel fit my feet well because I have a wide, something with a rubber ring to protect your feet from the the rock and the shale and stuff. Um, That would be what I would lean towards. I think a lot of times guys will get boots that are way too heavy for what they're doing, and that helps wear them out you know if you don't have to carry it you know but if you got ankle problems and things like that know your situation it's probably a good idea to go with a stiffer boot um back to the if you're prepared and you're a mental guy i think it's money ahead to buy the equipment and go elk hunting Mm -hmm. and you should do that if you're not be honest with yourself i think you're money ahead to do some research and find a good outfitter and you're going to learn enough about elk and things like that and the equipment you really need and you're going to have more a higher chance of being successful and learning it, it can be if you get the right guide and you don't know anything about it and you're not that driven person you're probably gaining five years of experience in one hunting season going with a, a quality guide right and in today's day and age you can find a lot of info on the internet mm-hmm. youtube and stuff sure like that if it's you know so, and some of it's good yeah it's, it's kind of like archery talk yeah. you can find some great stuff on archery talk right but you can also find you know <laughs> yeah you, you gotta, gotta know sit, to you gotta know what yeah. to look for and and if you don't know you don't know right you know it's but i i would recommend anybody if you have 
have just a little bit of a desire to go, be honest with yourself, and you should go because it, it's fun. And there there are easier places to go. You know, Colorado, a ton of people go. It's great. I love the state of Colorado for elk hunting because I can go every year. Mm-hmm. But if you're physically not, you know, able to handle that, there are parts of New Mexico that are pretty easy to get around. Arizona can be pretty easy to get around. Other areas, even in those states, can be fairly rough, too. Right. But you have to draw those two states. Oh, yeah. so. Draw or by a landowner. Right. Okay. Voucher. You have to draw tag in, in Colorado now? No, in, New, in Mexico. Certain, certain New Mexico. Mexico. Yeah, yeah there, there are limited entry units yeah. where you build preference points and stuff, but there are a lot of the majority of states over the counter. That's what I was thinking. We yeah. it was back in '83 though when we went. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think Idaho you can buy over the counter, and Montana usually has leftover tags every year. Yeah, they they've got a general, and then they've got a draw. F- because in Idaho too, there are certain areas where you can get a general license and, and put in for the draw to to be drawn. Yeah, for for certain units that are higher quality, limited number of hunters. Uh, Montana has the same thing. Wyoming. They've got a general license, and then they've got limited entry, and you can build bonus points and stuff. And is Idaho easier to hunt than Colorado? No, <laughs> it seemed like it. <laughs> Actually, depending on where you're at, um, you know, there are parts of Colorado that aren't that bad. There are parts right. that are fairly rough, um, especially when you start getting in that southern edge, can get pretty, pretty steep. Um, Idaho is one of the few places I remember. I took a buddy, and and we were standing, and the elk literally wasn't half a mile away from us we could see it plain as day naked eye but it was half a day to get down and back up (laughs) because it was that steep right so yeah that's why it it can be pretty rough you gotta repel down the side (laughs) climb (laughs) and and idaho you know years ago before hunting fool and everybody started talking about it it was a hidden gem because it was over the counter and nobody was hunting it where colorado always gets a fair amount of pressure idaho wasn't getting any and then the last several times i went it was it was busy, busy. <laughs> it was harder to get away from the crowds, right. put it that way. I had a guy tell me today he bought a point in Wyoming or somewhere mm-hmm. for antelope. Yep. I, I, actually, I bought mine the other day. and I put in for the elk girl, but I bought my mule deer and antelope point um, earlier this week. Got max points for both of them. Really? So you going next year then? I, I don't know. With football and things like that, I kind of hate miss. I'm yeah. getting soft in my. <laughs> <laughs> um, next year, if I if I can draw either any of the sheep tags or goat tag or moose tag, my son can video and I'll I'll watch it and we have that understanding. But when it comes to elk, antelope, and mule you know mule deer, I'm gonna. He's getting to that age. With if if I draw work. a really good tag on you know like. Arizona, you can, the way they've got the system now, there's a, a random draw. And if I draw, say, <laughs> a unit 3C on the five points that I've got, I'm going to take it yeah. and run <laughs> and, and go. But I'm not going to intentionally draw a couple tags that I could with the points that I have because I, I don't want to miss them. Did you have a lot of points built up in Arizona? Um, whenever I drew, unfortunately, yeah, I, I had about nine in the area I drew was was okay, but I was going on a lead to from some guys that I know that live out there that were telling me about some parts of this unit that nobody wanted to go to because it was a booger to get to. Yeah. Unfortunately, that was the year I blew out my Achilles, uh, and I yeah. was on crutches, so I was... So you don't have points there now? Yeah, I've, I've got five going, uh, or I'll have six going in. I heard somewhere year. where they, like, screwed a lot of people... They changed the point system there or something maybe? Well, they did change the point system because it used to be they would give it to the max guys, and now yeah. they've got a percentage going to max and then a small percentage you can still draw in the random. Oh, so you know, it's not. It's, so it may I, be a good thing. It's a good thing. It depends yeah. on where you're setting. You know, I wish Colorado – I've got enough points. Like right now I've got um, 15, 15 or 16 points for elk in Colorado. And I'm pretty much – Unit seventy six, only one I can draw because I'll, I don't, I know I'll never get enough for ten two two oh one up and up by dinosaur in that corner, where it's really good because they don't give out enough tags, and there are too many people with points above me. Mm-hmm. Um, unit sixty one's a long shot. I don't think I'll ever get that. You know, forty one's another really good unit, but it's all private pretty much, so I probably won't hunt that. So seventy six is my spot. 
what about is there a certain age guys should not play the points game? I mean, I'm going to be yeah, I'm if, coming up on 50 years old, so I even mess with if, it. If you're 50 years old and you're going in to say like a state of Colorado, mule deer points build them. You know, because you can draw some really good units with not a lot of points, especially for archery. And you can buy those points every year? Does it only take like two or three to draw? Yeah. Yeah. It depends on what unit it is. You know, some of the high country units, you know, you're 50% odds with zero points. Um, One point, you're pretty much you're guaranteed you're going to get it. Um, Others take two to three. Um, You get up to, say, unit... Uh, 2130, I hunted that area a few years ago. It was a great area. But at the time, it took about four or five points. Now it's taken eight or so. You could still draw that, and that's a hunt you could go do. Um, As far as elk, there aren't very many units that are that much better, you know, for a low point number. You you probably won't live long enough to, or have enough points to get into, say, 76 mm-hmm. because that point creep goes up every year. You know, whenever I first started, it took seven points to draw that unit. Well, now it takes like 13, 14. It goes up every year because the number of people are putting in for it. And it's getting easier to do that, which is a good thing. But it's it was also nicer when... Not as many people knew about it. Right. <laughs> you know, it, it's a double-edged sword. I'm glad people are going. Yeah. And you can only get one point per year? Yes. Is that right? How do you apply your points? How do you apply? Whenever, buy them. You know, buy like, them. You, you put in for the draw, and you can do, like, every state's different. you got to get the proclamation and, and study it. Um, but, like, Colorado, there's a deal whenever you go online to, to put in for it, or at least for elk, you can go in. And there's a special code that you're putting in for points only. You're sending in the the total amount for a cow, an antlerless mm-hmm. permit. If then, you, then you get that back. But you get that back minus minus, minus a nice yeah. little fee. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 You you would flip if you knew how much I send out every year for all the states for all the different right. species that I put in for. But every state's different. You know, New Mexico, you don't build points. You're every every year's a random draw, and then you start looking at the the outfitter allotment and stuff like that. It's I was this close to quit <laughs> even messing with that state. Um, Arizona is a good deal because every year you put in, and then after I believe it's five years of putting in, you get a loyalty point, so you get an extra bonus point. And then, like what I did, I was out on a coos deer hunt. And because I drove out there, I went ahead and went up to Tucson and took the Hunter Edge class, which I'm an instructor, but I still had to take it out there, and I got a Hunter Edge point. And those points for elk and stuff, yeah, it's another year. But when I started looking at the number, because I had like 16 or 17 uh, Desert Bighorn Sheep points, when you start looking, when you get that high and you look at one more point, what that put me into because I can see how many people have 16 points, 17 points, 18 points. It upped my odds substantially. So yeah. I went ahead and took the class. And most of these states you have to have a hunter. You have to have hunter education. Yes. It depends on your age and, and everyone's different. So you got to check the regulations. Do you have to have the archery education? Thing some, too? some you do. Are you an instructor Alaska, on that? Yes. Alaska, well, you was, have to have I no mean, hunter education. We need to get this. We all need to get that, I think. Yeah. yeah. And and I was doing it through the state mine. of Kansas, but they, they discontinued the, the program, or the last I knew they discontinued it, and I, hadn't, I haven't taught a class in several wow. years. But I think it's neat, and I think it's good for, for people to, to do it. Hmm. Would you recommend anybody around here, or do you know somebody around here that could? I don't know who's doing them now. Like I said, Kansas was doing them. Missouri didn't have the bow hunter ed at that time. And you have to have it in Nebraska to hunt whitetail, don't you? Or, uh, if I remember right, you do. You, uh, I don't know if you have to have bow hunter because I didn't have bow hunter I whenever was. I started hunting whitetails up there. Yeah. You had to have hunter education, and you got to have it on file, if I remember right, before you can apply or something. I, I know Iowa is the same way. You got to have a hunter ed on file in their records before you can enter the draw. If I remember. Now, if someone's interested in Wyoming for elk, do they have to have a, a guide to go into the wilderness area? Into the Is wilderness right? area, yes, you do. Yep. Is there still places to hunt that's not wilderness? Oh, yeah. The biggest part of the state is really? okay. not wilderness, BLM, you know. So th- there are some really good areas in, in Wyoming that aren't wilderness. 
there are some beautiful, breathtaking areas that are wilderness, but you do have to have an outfitter to, I see. to access it. What about non-resident in Kentucky for elk? You know anything about? I'd have to look it up. Yeah, I, I've I've heard, I've read some stuff with some really big bulls. There, being there's killed been some Kentucky. big bulls being killed, and I know we can apply. I don't know the exact. I I haven't been putting in in Kentucky to be honest. I, I just I don't even remember where I read it, but it they were talking about they were think, saying that the next world record will come out of Kentucky instead of I out saw of Western, Western somebody State. sent me a picture of a bull that was killed in that 380 390 range just here recently in Kentucky it was a giant yeah they've been killing some big whitetails there this year too have been for several years yeah. yeah a lot of early big whitetails mm-hmm. um, you have any hunts coming up um, I drew an Iowa tag, so I need to actually go up. I'm going up this weekend to check some cameras and hang a few more stands. Um, and I've got Missouri whitetails, and I've got a pretty good buck picked out. I'd yeah. say. <laughs> Looking for. Picked out. <laughs> yeah. You going to show us that picture? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just as long as there's no. <laughs> <laughs> well, nobody, we don't know where the property yeah. is. But all right. <laughs> I've seen it. <laughs> Never so, mind. <laughs> but, but outside of that, that's that's all I'll do. And then in January, I'll go out to Arizona again and hunt coos deer and javelina and mule deer because that's an over-the-counter. It's a great time. Um, I meet up with my buddy Dennis again. He, we go down right on the border. and and I've heard Eddie Claypool say that's his favorite hunt yeah, on it, the show. It, it is extremely difficult. to Now, Eddie hunts them a little bit different. Um I, I know who Eddie is, but I don't know him. No stretch of imagination. But my buddy Dennis and him talk a lot, and he hunts them like we would a whitetail here. He sets up on them, and he hunts closer to Cherokee in some different areas um, than where we do. We're down in the, the high desert, and it's all spot and stock, and we have a blast hiking up on hills, glassing, glassing them, and then going after them. And if you can sneak up on a coos deer, you can sneak up on anything. Is that a hunt anybody can go do? Oh, yeah. You don't have to draw yeah. that? Nope. Over the counter. Havelina tags. Over the counter. Left over. Um, you can put in for the draw and be guaranteed to get one. Or they're, they're always undersubscribed, so you can go buy How one. How many can you buy? Um, you can buy two, but you can only shoot one in. you got to shoot them in different zones. So you can't shoot two in the same area. But I always just buy one. They're like 100 bucks. That's I'm all. already there. Wow. And it's... It's a blast, and it breaks up. You, you get humbled chasing those coos deer, <laughs> and then when you see a javelina, and and I've hunted javelina down in Texas and stuff, pretty target rich and not overly hard to to get in on. Those in Arizona are a lot harder to, you know, they're they're a lot more wary. We'll put it that way. Yeah. You can't just stumble up on them and shoot them. Usually, they're you better hone your stalking skills and it's always nice to have an equalizer because you shoot a half leaner get on a few stocks of those and it don't make you feel like such a loser when you're chasing <laughs> coos deer are they very, are they good to eat or half yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. once again you got it got to clean them they're stinking stinking animal yeah. um i don't mind eating them in arizona at all matter of fact i enjoy them um i've shot a few in texas that they're flea bitten <laughs> they're really? just nasty yeah yeah yeah, you got ticks and fleas and everything all wow. over you, just skinning them. Pretty yeah, nasty. gee whiz. Yeah, that's when you pay the outfitter to do yep. it. Yeah. You're going to have ticks and fleas all over you in a minute, fella. <laughs> <laughs> you guys have anything else? I had something all ago, but I forgot. Uh-oh. I'm old timers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He'll text us later. We'll call you. <laughs> About you, three days. Can you quickly go over broadhead tuning, how you tune your broadheads? Or yeah. is that something you can do quickly? Well, it, not real quick. <laughs> you know, and, and a lot of it, you know, it can vary from bow to bow, so it's it's not always a black and white situation. But I would say for the average guy going out, um, I would probably do a walk-back tune. You know, I shoot through paper, but that's not the end-all, be-all by any stretch. Um, shoot at a spot close up to a target and then back up and adjust your sight to where you're hitting that line is how I usually do it. I'll I'll put a cross or an X with electric tape. Mm-hmm. Aim at the middle, adjust your sight, more so for your left and right, get your up and down pretty close. Then back up, shoot, and then see what your reading is. If you're staying in that line, 
then I would keep backing up. And as long as you're in that line left and right, you're going to have pretty good success. It's going to be fairly easy. If it's walking one way or the other, that could be your grip. That could be your spine. It could be any contact. It could be how your broadhead lines up, how fast your bow is, how well your arrow's spinning with that broadhead on. I mean, there's a lot of different things that can affect it. Mm, yeah. um, but the quickest, easiest way for the average person that's listening, do a walk back tune. And then if you're noticing that it's walking in one direction, bump your rest just a little bit in the direction back towards the tape. How far? Very minute. <laughs> one sixty fourth, you know, sometimes can be a lot. Sometimes, depending on the bow system and spine issues, a lot of other things can affect it. Sometimes you actually have to move it in the direct, the opposite direction that you think it would need to get it to come back in line because all those other things. Mm-hmm. But I'll tell you, if you're shooting a low-quality arrow and the broadhead doesn't spin well and you're shooting a high speed and it's a big, high-profile broadhead, you better have a lot of patience because it's going to be tough. Yeah. I saw on Facebook the other day that a guy posted a picture that he couldn't, uh, that is, fill points were hitting down here and his broadhead was hitting way up here and somebody told him to move his knocking point Yeah, to bring those together. Can. Can. Um, that could be cam timing. That could be the amount of heel pressure that he puts on the grip, too. I mean... It, it can be a lot of different things. And is it just that, is he only shooting one broadhead or does he have more than one? I I make sure I've got a few that are spinning perfect and then I will the check The same it, brand or different same, brand? Same brand. And then if I'm not getting what I want with that brand, then I might try another brand. But usually I'll try a different stiffness in the arrow is what will usually help more than anything. Bring them together. Yeah. 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 There's my patience. Yeah, and even then, if a bow's bad enough <laughs> out of whack, <laughs> or, or you got enough things, I mean, basically, you got a one inch wing up here too. Right. You know, at the He's end of the day, at an expandable. What's yeah. what's which one is that? That's the Ulmer Edge. Yeah, the Ulmer Edge, which yeah. they don't make anymore, but that's similar to say, you know, as far as that aerodynamics, similar to a Swacker, which I think is a, a pretty good head. This is a good head too, by the way, um, but it still can catch enough wind that it can give you issues. And don't just screw on an expandable. You know, you're shooting your field tips and then screw on an expandable and say, I'm good to go without no. at least practicing because they they can walk on you big time, mm-hmm. you know. So do you think, like, uh, I shoot the kill zone, and, the, you mm-hmm. know, they, they usually give you a practice, practice tip. tip. Mm-hmm. And I've got three or four of them now. Mm-hmm. Is that just about as accurate as you're going to get? Or do you actually need to put the real broadhead on and shoot it? Uh, with those, you really it's really hard to shoot that broadhead because you're going to tear tear it up. Right. And you, I mean, I, the practice ones I think are fine. Okay. You know, it's it's not a exact. <laughs> yeah. But it, it's it's going to be really close, especially if if they're hitting with your field tips, they've got enough surface up up there that it's going to show you if there's an issue or not. I use those. Um, the Helios that we talked about. Uh-huh. And it, but the way you explained it to me was you have steering in the front and the steering in the back as far as you can get it. Uh-huh. They shoot them just fine. I was really surprised. Yeah. And, and, you know, a lot of that is tune, spine, all those different things can can come up and when they come together. It can be super easy and it can be super hard. I've got two bows exactly the same. And I got one a couple of weeks before I went to New Mexico and I'm a bow, I tune bows all the time, but unfortunately, I always mess with everybody else's. <laughs> but I know my first one, it all went together super easy. And I know I just need to adjust some shims to get my other one. And it shoots pretty good, but not as good as I would like. And I can tell you that always hitting with your field tips, that's not always the end all be all either. Because I've, I've gotten, I've, on certain bows that I've had, my personal bows, I've got to where my field tips were grouping super tight and my broadheads were grouping super tight, maybe two inches to the right, say at 70, 80 yards or however far or whatever. And it's that far, whether it's 20 yards or 80 yards, but that's just where it is. And it's in a perfect line and my groups are super tight. I can adjust it to get them to where they overlap, but now my broadhead group has opened up 30% is what's better. Mm-hmm. 
It depends on who you are. I, w- I want the most accuracy I can get out of it. And if I have to move my sight just a little bit to, to make up for that, you know, luckily my my V37 from zero to actually 120 yards, my broadheads and field tips stack on top of each other. Right. Um, I can change broadheads and do a couple different things, and it might not. But with the system that I'm shooting now, they they like it. But the exact same bow, I mean, down to except for the camo finish, the other one that I got later, and I haven't totally gone through it. I know the timing's good. Everything's set. It won't, and it doesn't group quite as well. What most people would call very acceptable, I know it'll do better because I got another one that's carbon copy that'll shoot just unbelievably good. So I need to make a few adjustments to it, but the fine-tuning of that can be a, a headache. What <laughs> right. What brought it? Um, I've shot a lot of stuff with the Shuttle Tees. They're great. Um, this year I'm shooting the Slick Trip, uh, Viper Tricks. Um, I was using those. I'm shooting a, a lighter poundage. Um, that what you just, shot your elk with? Yeah, that's what I shot my elk with. It's the the cutting efficiency on it's really good. They're super sharp. It's easy to take the blades in and out. They're very tough. To so penetra- they're built for penetration, and I'm not shooting as much power. Probably not a good idea for Vince to shoot them in if they're that sharp. <laughs> They'll no, cut the crap out of you. <laughs> yeah. when you. When you group your arrows, don't you get tired of refletching your arrows? In the I, cutting I'm not going to shoot the same spot. <laughs> <laughs> I will put a number of spots and yeah, yeah I, I compare where they hit. Tear them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I compare where they hit and yeah. Kind of just I just think something I've always had trouble wrapping my head around is you take your bow to a shop and uh, you shoot your your field points and you make a perfect bullet hole. Well, mm-hmm. then that shop tells you, well, that bow's tuned. It's tuned. And then you go out and shoot it and you you do walk back tuning or something. You have to move your rest. That sounds to me like you're taking your bow out of tune because if you go back inside and shoot your field point, that may not shoot a perfect bullet hole again. Exactly, but at the end of the day, are you, you shooting paper? That, like we've talked about it, they don't, yeah. give, they don't give extra bonus points for arrow flight at right. ASA shoots. And at the end of the day, I want my broadheads to hit where I'm looking yeah. and where I'm aiming. And I don't care what it looks like through paper with a field tip. And what I found a lot of times, because you're, you're changing the aerodynamics of the the system. If your sp- spine is good, the knock travel on the bow is really good, and some other things, all that is going to marry together. But if you start changing any of those variables and what you do with how you're gripping the bow, and every bow likes to be held a little bit different too, then that's where you start getting the variables. If I know that from zero to 80, my broadheads are shooting in a perfect line, and I'm not seeing corkscrew. And I walk in and I get a half inch tear through paper, you know, at six foot. You don't care. I, I could care less. Right. <laughs> you know, coming from professional bow tuners, and, and I, <laughs> I'm about as anal as Technical you will as you find. Get. And and back to the other thirty seven that I got. That's why I'm. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I got something to tell you here in a yeah. second. Anyway. So so yes, yeah, so I I want. Absolute perfection, but there are so many different variables yeah. that most people don't. You know, I look over at Pib; he's got <laughs> all kinds of arrows that he can grab and check and find what the sweet one is. Not everybody's going to do that. They go and they buy, right. you know, a dozen arrows going into season, and that's what they've got. And I get enough bow. The other day, I got a an elite bow that was a great shooting bow, and the guy was telling me it was a rough drawn piece of crap. Couldn't hit nothing with it. Whenever I got it, the shop local one i won't name names anyways they had wrapped the cables around each other they were literally twisted they crossed but they were twisted (laughs) and he goes it won't shoot for nothing and the center shot was way i mean i I believe keeping a bow pretty much in center and then whenever it's not shooting within reason you can uh, bump it a little bit one way or the other but if you're Center shot says 13 sixteenths, and you're an inch and a half to get a bullet hole. Not something, so much. It's telling you something. Yep. Okay, and that's what this bow was. Unwrap the cables, put them in time, everything. Now, all of a sudden, it's the best shooting bow he's ever had. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. Huh. Yeah. Yep. Well, so if somebody wants a bow well, like that, how do they get – how can they get a hold of you? 
Well, like I mentioned earlier, I'm not the best on Facebook, but I will answer my messages. You can message me on Facebook at Chase Archery or Doug Hutchison. I'll, I'll get back either way. You can call me at 816-885-7599, and I will get back with you as soon as possible. Starting January, February 1st. I was going to say, I've, I'm, <laughs> I've got bows right now. I will do them right now, but the closer to the end of October we get, your waiting period will be a lot longer. I'm sorry. It just <laughs> it yeah. will be. Um, you know, that, that's how you get a hold of me. I do have a website, but. Well, people, the much. new bows are coming out now, and guys are yep. buying new bows. Mm-hmm. You might as well just get the new bow and ship it right to you. Sure. You that, kidding? That They're perfect great. when they you come know, from the shop, aren't they? Well, <laughs> <laughs> the, you know, there there are variables with how you, you place your hand and things like that. And, you know, I know Jim Forbes and I have talked about that. And, and yes, he's right. But also how many shops – especially with the cam systems being more and more advanced. If you don't have a, a draw board, they shouldn't be allowed to sell half the bows they sell. And and not too many of them have them. And just Nor because have they the, have that draw board doesn't mean, mean they, they use it. it. Yeah. Just having the bows set and timed, and I, I can foresee issues, you know, in your setup. If it's an arrow issue, I can tell you before it becomes a, a hair-pulling problem, you know, things like that. I know when the machine shoots it, an absolute perfection, 99 times out of 100, you're going to do something really well with it. And then if you send me one that you've already set up and you like the way it's shooting now, I can mimic that to a T. Yes, he can. Yes, he can. <laughs> oh, but what I was going to tell you was my buddy Jake, I talked to him the other day. Yeah. We actually From took State that. Farm? We, yeah. <laughs> and he wears khakis, khakis. to work. <laughs> but. We got the other mod put in because you made some adjustments to the bow sure. and said, if you change that mod, it'll be perfect. Got it put in. It was like you were still staying in there working on it. I mean, it was perfect. Good. Good. I talked the other day. He ended up not being able to go on the antelope hunt. That's he tough. had some issues come up at work. I mean, that were bad. Yeah. So he bailed out. Michael Michael Braden went with us anyway, so it, it sure. worked out. But I asked him, I go, so is the bow shooting good? He said, well... Out to 70, it's dead on. I go and pass that. He goes, I don't have a place to shoot farther past that. Or it would be then, too. But yeah, he, That's awesome. He, he loves it. Good. And it hasn't cost him a penny so far. And he took my other dozen arrows that we built. There we I go. built them the same way you told me to. Even better. Yeah. I need friends like that. And speaking <laughs> of which. He hasn't <laughs> spent a penny yet. That's the worst, best I'm, part for him. I'm if somebody take... wanted to, they can send their arrows to you, too, and you'll build them for them, right? Sure. Mm-hmm. So. The, what's the best way to do that? Call you up and give you like the bow specs and stuff, and you guys could discuss what mm-hmm. the best arrow option is. Sure, take a picture of that, Jack. Pip's getting ready to send a bow back. <laughs> he needs worked on. <laughs> that one blow up. On this, you? I had this one Those come in parts. the shop the other day. <laughs> <laughs> Guy came in with this one, said, uh, "Can you put that back together?" Wow. I got it three fourths of the way put back together and mis- missing one piece. Did he have it painted or something? He dipped it. Do you remember yeah, the guy yeah. that had the de- camo dipping place yeah. up at Rogers? Yeah. That's, that's where mm-hmm. uh, he, he owned it, and he, t- he had them take it apart two years ago. He dipped it. It's been in this box since. <laughs> I've and got those parts. I've seen that, that one before. <laughs> Do what? I've seen those before. <laughs> I, I was just going to ask you if you knew anything about this particular model. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> so. so I'm supposed to send that home with you. If it's all right with you. <laughs> Can do. Yeah. Now, well, we need a picture because it's a full bow, and it's in a box that's about 9 inches wide and 12 yeah, inches long do and do 6 like inches this. deep. It's just parts. <laughs> <laughs> It'll go back together. Oh, Man, yeah. I thought I was doing this guy a solid, too. I was rocking and rolling, and he went to – he was out of beer, so he ran to the store, and – uh I get it all the way put together, and I'm like, wait a minute, what's this? Oh, that ain't good. And it was a, a rocker, oh, limb right. rocker. You'll blow it up quick without a rocker. And I said, I can't help you, bud. So <laughs> yep. he, Doug was actually, you were in New Mexico at the time. Yep. And when I texted him the picture, <laughs> I said, you know what this is? He's like, oh, I might know. <laughs> <laughs> so he, and he said he had one. So yeah. yeah, I've got some rockers for it. But But that. You know, something as small as a little bitty piece like that can cost you a lot of heartache and money if, or an injury. I'm, I I had a guy, he he had cracked a, a limb on a destroyer mm-hmm. and took it to a shop, and they 
did the warranty work on it, and they wanted to be the ones to, to do it. And I, I flat told him, make sure they put the rocker in. Okay, okay. And he, they put the limbs in. He draws back, and at full draw, I saw the limb start to move. I'm let down, and about that time, the limb shot out the back. Mm. The bottom limb takes off. It drives the cam through the flex guard, cut Ooh. it into. If that would have hit his arm. It had chopped him up. It had just mangled him. It shot the arrow backward. It was a mess. I mean, I was in law enforcement. I got shot at it, and it wasn't as scary as that. <laughs> and, and it was a little bitty plastic piece that it's kind of important. And if somebody's not paying attention when they do that, it's it's dangerous. Well, I'm Did glad I caught it? that and didn't send him out of here like that. Yeah. Did they give him a whole new bow? Got new limbs and new parts. God. <laughs> That's one of them. Where you, know, you, go, you know what? Just go over there and pick your one you out. Start, we'll uh, that should. <laughs> should. Why don't you start Doug Hutchison University and have dealers come in and train them? I've done some, some different classes and things like that over the years. Yep. But as long as he's got Vinny buying new bulbs about every <laughs> month or two, he's going to stay solid right where Vinny's he's at. Nothing. I've got guys that live across the country that ship me bows, it seems like, weekly. Which, oh, thank you. <laughs> if you're listening, up. thank Keep you. Keep it up, fellas. Yeah. Keep it up. This is but. Wow. <laughs> oh, that's funny. What do you got to say about that, Vinny? I can't wait to hear this. You're Vin- – Get ready to hit the For the button. record, he, he does great compared to a lot of people I know. Hey. UPS has got a pickup spot, Bob. <laughs> Pibs. What are you looking same. at me for? <laughs> are you saying Pib doesn't do very well? No, I'm saying if you're going to throw storm, I don't hear him piping up any at all. Nope, not, not, at all. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> I you, used to be you've the, been hey, a while since you've had a new bow. I, I used to be the yeah. guy. Yeah. Not new, different. <laughs> Don't go uh, splitting uh, hairs, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> Is Julie down there more than you are? No. No. Okay. She tends to find something that works for her, and women don't like stick change. to it. And personally, everybody's a little bit different. I, I think that's a smart way to go too. You usually end up shooting better. The more you know the bow, how it wants to be held, how it wants to be shot, I think the better off you are. I but, can't uh, tell you the number of bows that I wish I still had. Oh yeah. <laughs> That's why I own seven Q2 XLs with custom limbs <laughs> and a different cam. But that riser, and I don't shoot them anymore, but that was for some reason. And I know guys that hated that bow. I haven't talked to a ton of people that just loved it. That one just fit me for some reason. What was your opinion on the Tricon? <laughs> Personally, I, I didn't care for it. That it much. was a great hat. Matter of yeah. fact, we've had that discussion. I know, <laughs> I know several guys that, it. Loves that, it. <laughs> that had it and loved it. I hate um, it. That, was, that was one of it. my least favorite Hoyts they've ever yeah. made. Well, see, Larry told you hey, loved his, too. I shot that bow like a bag. house on fire. Camp and I were talking about the so, other day. He shot it well, too. He liked it. Yeah. And and the draw cycle. that oh, I, it I, I, engineering wise, I, I can name a few things that I didn't like about it. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it just wasn't one that I, I cared for too much, but I know guys that did. So yeah. that's I wish you... I'd have known you back then because my arrow was sticking out like this way to get it to shoot right. Yeah. <laughs> that's that, that's <laughs> because back then they, they did everything with a slip yoke. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. unless you served that yoke in, you yeah. couldn't you couldn't uh, cam lean. Yeah, I, tuner. I remember a, a, a tuner that's fairly popular that was trying to convince me at the ATA show that that was the best thing in the world, man. He was a big guy on archery talk, and <laughs> I go, then why are all the pros serving that in? <laughs> there, there's a reason. Now, now, on some, it worked great, and that, that was the thing. If, if everything was perfect on it from pocket angle to limb deflections and a lot of shims, axle holes, everything, if all that lined up and the stars were just right, it worked, and they were shooting machines. But if it wasn't. Good luck. How far are we as far as technology on bows? Can they continue to improve, or are they starting to hit a plateau? I, I think it's it's getting close. I, I, there, there are some things they can do. I think you're going to see some speed jumps, but not as much as we did in the last 20. I think in 20 years they're not going to be a light year unless there's just totally different materials. Um, you know, you get some people – 
like Dave at PSC whenever they they did the X4 Slim, that really made a a huge jump. And I, matter of fact, at the time, that's when I was doing this right here. And that material and the material that they were using was the exact same stuff because the guys at Gordon were telling me, and I flat asked them because I was running cycle tests and everything else, and I'm like, how can they do that? And the guys at <laughs> Gordon said, we're not going to warrant it. We don't think it'll last. End up being one of the toughest limbs out there. Wow. wow. And you see that everybody has gone to the past parallel. Copied it. I mean, yeah. they're, they're copying that basic design to get more efficiency out of it. Um, but to be able to do that, there was some changes in the materials. And, you know, I think the string advancements, that that's one place that could improve. There, <clears throat> there are some things that could get better, but it's pretty dang good right now. You know, you go back 10, 15 years, it wasn't <laughs> Luckily, the cams weren't as finicky. They were just barely breaking 300 feet a second back 10, 15 years ago. Yes and no. Some 10 years ago, there what? There's not as big of a jump, and you start looking at some of the efficiencies too. It depends on if you want a IBO speed number. Yes, they're definitely higher now, but if you went to say an AMO standard, or you know that same 70 pound bow shooting a 450 grain arrow, you take a 320 bow and a 340 bow or a three say a 312 bow like right. that q2xl it's not that much slower as a matter of fact i've seen them to where they'll actually pass them with arrow weight than a bow that's 30 40 foot a second faster right. with a light arrow it will never i can never get an arrow light enough to shoot as fast as this one but this one won't shoot a heavy arrow as fast as what this one will just because of the way the efficiencies are in the cam system. I'd rather have the heavy arrow. Me too. Me too. And <clears throat> and tunability and with it staying in tune and time and, oh, quiet. and shootability, quietness. It, there, there are a lot of different factors. Whenever I'm picking a bow for my myself, I have a, a list of things that are non-negotiable. And speed isn't in that top five to ten. You know, but that's I what they advertise the most. Before. But but that's yeah. what sells. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. mean, without a doubt, I've I've seen guys come in the shop and, you know, they they read their bow supposed to shoot 360 foot a second, and but the guy that sold it to them didn't tell them. Well, you've got a 27 inch draw length, yeah. and you're only <laughs> shooting, and you're only shooting 58 pounds. You're shooting yeah. 62 pounds, yeah. and you know your arrow weighs 450 grains. Yeah. Yeah. You're, not break, you're not even close to 300. 260. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. I barely made. Well, what, what did we do mine? 257? Something like yeah. that. I mean, it wasn't fast, but it's good. It shoots good. Well, I, I speed can help, and speed is nice, <clears throat> but not all speed is equal. You know, you take a 300-grain arrow going 288 foot a second, or you take a 450-grain arrow going 288 foot a second, they're the exact same, right? Nope. No, not even close. No. Because the whole reason why you want speed is your pin gap or the arrow drop. That 450 grain arrow isn't dropping near as much. You can shoot through a chronograph at 40 yards, and it's not dropping speed anywhere near like that 300 grain arrow is. It's dumping fast. Mm -hmm. So your pin gap actually well, opens up. Right. Your 20 and 30, you know, if you're shooting, say, 320 with a 300 grain arrow and 288 with a 450 grain arrow, at the end of the day, the heavier one's still more efficient. Your pin gap at longer distances where you need it is smaller. Is smaller. So what's your setup look yeah. like, Doug? <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> Jack's over here melting down. I'd like to read this. What's your setup now? What are you shooting? I'm shooting about 58 pounds. I do have a long draw length, you know, 31 inches. Um, and I always try to keep for hunting, no matter what poundage I ever get down to, I try to keep in that 425, anything north of 400. Yeah. You know, I think you can go too heavy unless I was going, you know, to shoot anything in North America, 425 grain arrows to 450 is plenty. There's no way you killed that elk at 58 pounds. <laughs> I've shot elk at 42 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> well, that would explain what you just said would explain why my, why my 50 the gap between my 40 and 50 is less than my 30 and 40. Oh, uh, no, because that that's an anchor acquiring the target, something like that yeah. is the difference. <laughs> because you now they can start out closer, but your gap doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't hit a speed to where 
it opens and then closes back. It's yeah, it's going to drop him. more and more as far it's, the it's farther it goes. The it's how fast it's dropping. It's probably him punching, it's how you're punching his back tension. You figure in your Marlboro. Well, those back tensions, <laughs> if, if you just understand them, they're easy to break them off. <laughs> there, Benny just nailed it. What did he say? I had I didn't figure in for my Marlboro. No. Oh. <laughs> he lights a Marlboro for a juke to 50. <laughs> Everything gets faster. <laughs> what about uh, Might not be carbon, a <laughs> carbon versus aluminum riser? Any opinions? Depends on how well built they're how well they're built. Um, I think the aluminum risers they're using a little higher grade aluminum now. They are testing them a little bit more and making them stiffer. Um, carbon's pretty nice because it doesn't get cold. I think they have the the systems down really well. I haven't seen bad carbon in a while, but you go back to the carbon forerunner and some of those. <laughs> oh, thank they're, God. I thought I was going to say Matrix. I'm like, oh, no, right. no. <laughs> Did high, didn't High Country have, like, the first carbon riser? No, or? actually, I believe it was PSC, truth be told. Um, really? Yeah, they had one. I know Diamond started out with carbon. Um, high Country followed pretty quick. Okay. Um, I just know that but High Country I, I was know, the first one I ever saw. Yeah, and, and it was a real. It was probably the most popular of all of them at that time. Um, the problems were the the bushings that they were putting in them and stuff, and the processes weren't as as advanced as what they are now. Um, but kind of like what you asked, where is it going to go in ten years, twenty years? Something outside of the box is what's going to be to get us. You know, Give us they, a big jump. When they make a bow and call it the good luck, <laughs> 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 you're really questioning whether or not you should shoot that bow. Yeah. I haven't. But. For the most part, they're they're all pretty good anymore. I, yeah, there used to be some that were just absolute mm-hmm. <laughs> pieces of crap that shouldn't have ever been put out on the market years ago. No but, but now you're, you're going to get flyers, and that's from any company. It's still a mass-produced put yeah. together and there are a lot of pieces that go together and you will find an issue you know i had a guy he, i'm not going to say the boat company because i don't want anybody to to think that it's bad but he he broke a limb on a, a bow i have yet to see any bow company that hasn't had a broken limb right any they all can happen well, some do it more than others but they're all pretty good now i mean there there are some that are and that's not necessarily the bow company though that could be the that's guy the material that could be a lot of times what it is is whenever the the carbon is laid out say it's gordon which is the stuff that i use when i was designing and i think they make a, a really good glass that's what a lot of people use yep. when it's laid out if any of those fibers which are a fraction of the size of a human hair get twisted up you can get air pockets and whenever that resin and everything gets put in there and it's molded, now you've got a dry spot. If that hits in a certain part of the limb, you're okay. It's not going to hurt anything. But if it happens to hit right where the grind is or right where a high stress point is, you know, on this limb, I can tell you that right here is a high stress point, you know. So the quad limb, that took all that out. But there are inherent issues that can happen there, too. So... There, there are a lot of different factors that cause limb failure. A lot of times it's people put under the pressure. On. <laughs> well, I was going to say it could be somebody dropped it. Could I know been something else. But. It's been, what, about six or seven years ago, Hoyt had problems with just little splinters coming off the, the yeah, outside edge of the, years the limbs. Was it just a couple of years ago? No, it's, it was the ones I remember. The ones yeah. I had was yeah. probably five it, or six it, years ago. It would happen, and that, that doesn't necessarily affect you don't want to buy a bow that expensive. It's not a catastrophic. Oh my goodness! I snipped it off and sanded it down, and I've done that. Too. Nobody. I mean, there was. And you shoot thousands of times. Yeah. I know with this limb, we would put it on a, a cycle tester, and you know you could get a, a small splinter because of what I was just talking about. Just it happened to hit, and you could go ahead and cycle it longer than other limbs that were brand new from other manufacturers. And they would have catastrophic failures, and that one would still be going and quadruple the number of cycles, and the others would never get there. And it was still theirs were still a lifetime warranty limb. You know, the little splinters. It, I don't think they should do that. I think they should do some stuff on their finish to to try to help prevent that. Um, but they sell a lot of bows, and they're they're a great bow. 
But yeah, it's, if a guy does that during hunting season, I'm not going to worry about it. If you do it in the middle of the summer, I would warrant it so you have new limbs. Yeah, I think mine happened during hunting season. I yeah. I did that, and I went ahead and I, I shot it all through the next summer. You know, I had a pair of set of XT two thousand limbs that I kept from from bow to bow to bow. Sometimes mm-hmm. you know, and uh, it had a it had a splinter down the side like that, and kind of one piece in the middle of the limb that it flaked off, and I just kept shooting them. I mean. I wasn't scared of them. I yeah. wouldn't sell them to somebody like that. Yeah. But now, if they're delaminating or something like that, yeah, totally different, different story. Yeah. Right, PSC, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. I'm, I, have you seen any of the the advertisements, like on Facebook or anything? PSC, yeah, it was Blake but, and Bobby. Yeah. Those guys. Uh, they were talking about their. I guess they're going to make their own strings uh-huh. this yeah. time, and mm-hmm. and uh, I, I didn't get to see the. Where, I just heard about that they were. They talked they about their machine, new process. Yeah. yeah, they're 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 trying to build them under more tension and a consistent tension, which is something that I try to do to because it does make a difference. Yeah. All right, we're going to start a new segment. It's called "You Got Two Minutes." <laughs> okay. You got two minutes, crossbows. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to just for the yeah. record, in case anybody's listening to this, um, I do not take crossbows. Okay. Um, an insurance issue. I, I know how to mess with them and stuff, but I don't have the equipment or the facility. Um, I'll I'll point you in the right direction. I'll tell you what, if you're having an issue, I can tell you some things to do to help. Um, and I'll do that over the phone for each charge. But I don't personally work on them. All right, the, the liability issues just, I'm, I probably should as a business standpoint, but I do other things that <laughs> afford me to where I don't have to. And, and really it's, it's not a a bow. I there's a lot more to it, and there's a lot more I can do for it. Where that one's, it's just different. Well, that that was a loaded question anyway. We had a conversation about crossbows a while back, but we kind of came to the conclusion that as long as more people are getting out there in the woods and hunting, it's probably a good thing. That's my take. But is it a fad? Is it going to go away quick because they're going to realize it's really I'm not going to say they're not as good as a compound bow. Did but the marker work go away quick? <laughs> no. It makes life easier. I think a lot of these archery yeah. shops are selling more crossbows than they are bows I, right now. I think they are, yeah. too. As a matter of fact, um, <laughs> I can tell you some guys that lobbied in the state of Pennsylvania, some sales reps that got lobbyists to get it pushed through. Mm-hmm. I know a major, major, I'm not going to name his name, but a major manufacturer of compound bows got in a major fight with Pope and Young years ago over the use of crossbows because he wanted one more gadget to sell. Yep. And in a moment of weakness, he admitted even then that it probably wasn't a very good business move. Right. He thought it was going to revolutionize archery, and what it did is made people a little bit lazier, and they don't have to practice, they don't have to shoot as much. That, you know, it is uh-huh. it is different. If it gets more people out hunting, it's great. I know the guys that lobbied for it in Pennsylvania, which was part of the the rollover to, to get it coming into a lot of other states, they thought it was great because they were sales reps, and that was a couple more gadgets they could sell. Yeah. Well, their sales have gone. They sell crossbows, but their overall volume of archery sales have dropped because people buy a crossbow, they keep it for years, and they don't have to practice it. They don't have the gadgets. They don't have – and at the end of the day, I don't care what you shoot. You can shoot a recurve, stick, and arrows, and self-bow. I'm good. I think it's great as long as you're getting out there and practicing with it. You're proficient, and you're hunting and enjoying the outdoors. We're yeah. good. If you want to shoot a crossbow, I'm great with it. I, I have no problem. But I think it's a shortcut, and people are losing that woodsmanship, the the feel of what archery really is. I think you're missing out on it. Right. Wow. Yeah, that's I was exactly told, what we came up with. Just get rid of the learning <laughs> curve. I was told by yeah. I was told by a, a, a rep here in Missouri when this first started four or five years ago. I said, man, there. I don't think this will ever happen. He goes, oh, it's going to happen. It's a it done. Happen. He goes, it's a, he said, it's a done deal. Yep. We're setting it up. It's yes. it's a done deal. It's going to happen. I knew it was and coming. It, for and years. it took, yeah. yeah. So, well, what, one more thing because we're almost. At, I'm sorry, Bob. Go ahead. Know, we were we were talking about a couple of podcasts ago about even trying to to get a, uh, a crossbow and and shoot it out at a at a farther distance through a chronograph to see if those crossbow bolts would would hold their 
you know. Uh, it, it depends on, and I have, and it yeah, depends okay. on how heavy the arrow is once again. Um, and I will tell you, if you're a proficient archer and you have the option, you know, because it used to be if you had a handicap, you could get a permit, sure, and yep. that, that would allow you to go use one, which which was fine. I had no issue with that. I really don't care if a guy wants to really use one now. I'm okay with it. But I don't think it's as big of an advantage as what most people think it is. Ex- nope, I don't either. Unless you're a guy that picks up your compound bow two days before season shoots one or two arrows, calls it good, and goes hunting, you're probably not, you know, you're not setting yourself up for a great amount of success. Where with a crossbow, you put the X on it, but you still got to sight it in. You still got to know distance because they drop just as fast as an if arrow. If not faster. If not faster because a lot of those manufacture, you know, the, the speeds, kind of like a compound, <laughs> that's with a super light arrow. That it's not even warranted to shoot through it anyways. Mm. So they're not near as fast as what people think. They're louder and crap, <laughs> and they're big oh, they and cumbersome and stuff like that. Uh, I used to hunt with Dad and his, and you know, Pete was within a hundred yards of me, and I shot at something I could scare you. I could hear him. Yeah, you know, no problem. Yeah, make you jump. I offered to shoot a dollar per arrow at fifty or sixty yards. Boy, that uh, he just bought one because he quote doesn't have enough time to to shoot his compound yeah. in the backyard, and. Mm-hmm. Uh, he used to, he used to work for well. He took the, my place over at Brunswick and managing that elevator over there. And and I told him I'd shoot him a dollar a shot, fifty sixty yards, however, what he wanted to. But it had to be offhand. I was gonna say offhand because yeah. they they don't balance very well unless you got a mm-hmm. stick or something. Did you show him the hole in the grain elevator? <laughs> Oop, <laughs> grain elevator in the door. Or the door of the grain garage elevator. door. Well, I don't have to show him that. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody needs to know about that. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm, I'm sure I've a lot let of enough people over. know about it. I'll release one off. I mean, that, that, arrow, that arrow was named Skipper. Yeah. But, uh, but, yeah, I've shot I, enough of them to have thrown a few bad ones out there myself. Uh, it, don't uh, feel bad. It, no, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> the damn guys just jinxed me. That's what yeah. it was. <laughs> when when archaeologists dig up the field behind my house in about a thousand years, they're going to think a major battle took place back yeah. there. Yeah. Uh, and there you, was no cowboys. What was they're going to find back here? <laughs> it was only Indians too. Yeah. Like, Indians with expandable Indians broad shot a Eastern fat boy. <laughs> yeah. so. Carbon content of the beans behind. But they the can't. High. Hey, one, go ahead. Crossbows can be. Unbelievable. Depending on which one, and there are a lot of things you can do to make them shoot a little bit better, and not all of them are created equal. Um, kind of like where compound bows were at one time. There's some that are better than others, and I'm not, I don't care. I'm not going to tell you about any brands. Just they are. Do your research. But you would be amazed at how well certain ones will shoot. I've I've literally shot one inch groups at 100 yards wow. with the PSE tags. They shoot phenomenal. Well, this boy, he says it shoots great at 10, 20, 30, 40 yards, but he says 50 yards, I'm, it shoots to the left. And he, he said, what, what, what's my problem? I said, your problem is you're shooting it too far. You don't need to be shooting at 50 <laughs> yards anyway. And he said, no, what's my problem? I said, I have no idea. I'd, I'm guessing it's probably that screw between your ears. And could be could be a couple don't different you have things. to keep yeah. the the rail lubed up and stuff real well on, on most models yes if yeah. you don't you'll burn through the serving real quick and if you're cocking it by hand which you used to see a lot of people do that's probably not so much now you can get the cams off centered and that mm-hmm. would cause accuracy problems and you'd get flyers and they weren't very good the triggers on some of them are atrocious um i, I mess with a lot of them but i I don't have the facility. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thanks well, for speaking of speaking of, of the bows and the performance you were talking about a second ago, all the, the new bows are starting to come out this mm-hmm. year, and it can be a little intimidating for guys. It's a little intimidating for me looking at these new bow prices. I seen <laughs> one bow that came out the other day was eighteen hundred bucks, eighteen seventy five. Yes. Woo. So, you order one, you talking about? that being said, right now, coming up is going to be a good time for you to pick up a bow because a lot of guys 40. trade bows every year. So the new, so there's going to be bows out on archery oh, yeah. talk for sale, and it mm-hmm. may be half price. Yep. And so what's, what should a guy look for when he's, when he's doing something like that? Is get, there any- get as many pictures as you can, you know, whenever you're buying them on archery talk. And I, I've helped guys, you know, I don't have a retail shop. I'm not mm-hmm. selling bows. Um, and I've helped a lot of people get bows off of Archer Talk or Craigslist, things like that. Start asking questions just like you would buying a car or something like that. 
And and usually the the standard answer, you know, just like if you pulled a guy over that's been drinking, <laughs> I've only had two beers. Uh, it's only been shot fifty times. <laughs> well, Grandma shot yeah, it every Sunday it, it on was her shot, way to church. It was shot fifty <laughs> times, all indoors. It's never been outside. And the picture they send me, it's up in a tree. <laughs> well, and that, that, yeah. that, that, that's something else that kills me about when you're selling something on there. They want it at half price, but they want it in new condition. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, Whenever I, I and my them. my answer to that is look. This is my Sunday afternoon tool. Right. You in, know, in case you're wondering. This thing's been to a billion 3Ds. It's got dings or it's marks. It's, it's, it's I going promise to have you, the lock screw. It, it will have a it. lock screw mark where the rest goes on. Yeah. Yep. It's going to happen. And right. does that, that doesn't affect anything. No. Are there dings in the cam tracks? Look at that. Look, show me some pictures of the limbs, and I want to see if there are any big gouges in it. Yeah. Scratches, just as long as it's not deep. If it's just a finish, it didn't hurt nothing. You know, a mark on the riser doesn't hurt it. Are there big gouges and dings in it and things like that? And then, brand, you know, you take a, a company, one of the only ones that does it, but like Elite, that's a transferable warranty. People don't realize yeah. you buy a Hoyt from a non-registered Hoyt dealer, you have no warranty on that. Mm-hmm. You know, Matthew's same way, a lot of them are. Yeah. Which, you know, that's just their company policy. You, if you're looking at an Elite, <laughs> you know, I, not to pimp any brand, their warranty is just, it's phenomenal. If there's you're buying a, to use one, there's a you're safe. Cherry Expression 3D Blue on sale, and the guy's a fantastic guy to buy from on Archer Talk <laughs> right now. Yeah. So, yeah. It's, it's, is his name Bob? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it may, may. On Archer Talk, though, to be what? 4X by 4X 24, 24 Bob? 4X, 4X 24, 4X 24 Bob. Bob, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, what gets me is the guy that he sent me a, a PM and said, this is the price, the going price on your bow right now. I will give this to you. It's $225 less than what I'm asking. It's nice and he setting. said, that I've looked at all the Expression 3Ds, and this is the going price. You should have bought one. <laughs> <laughs> and exactly. he, ta- he kind of told me which one it was. Uh, uh, you know what? So I, I just pulled up all the Expression 3Ds, and it was one, and it had marks all over it, you know, limbs. And it was, it was $225 cheap. I PM'd him back. I said, you need to buy that bow. Because for one thing, that's a hell of a price. and and it's But it's seen some, you know. But he said, I really want blue. I said, you need to buy that bow and paint the damn how, thing blue. <laughs> for how much do you want blue? I mean, it, we're, yeah. I, and, here's and, my price. Here's what, you know, I get guys that call me up and your strings are $100. I can get a set. Of X Y Z's for sixty dollars. Yeah, go yeah, for it. Buy them. That's what you. Sh- I mean, I've I've set my price, and but I'll tell you why they're different. I'm not going. I could I build you a sixty dollars set? Yes, but I'm not going to because I'm putting my name on it, yep. and that's mm-hmm. just not helping. Right. Well, that this, this guy ended up after I told him to buy that bow, you know, and everything else, which that bow is still not sold, he, and. So he sent me one. He said, well, here's another one that's cheaper than yours. Well, he sent me the wrong one. It was one that was $200 more than mine. I said, I'll tell you what. I'll sell you one. Sell you mine for $200 less than that one that you just oh, I would have bumped it up 100 <laughs> bucks. <laughs> but, yeah, I'll save you 100 a quarter. Did he ever answer you? No, he, he never. He, he, he said, I, I messed up on that one. I said, yeah. Man, I hate I hate those yeah. guys that want to get That's called there. showing your ass. Low, that ain't messing up. Ball, yeah. I, I had like, that. When I set a price there, it's a fair price. Yeah. I, I set one up. A, a, a bow, it was one you know about. I'm not going to name the brand. It was an excellent bow. Carbonizer, really nice bow. Unfortunately, because of an injury I have in my elbow, at my draw length, it hurt me to shoot. And I, we just weren't going to work out. And it didn't take very many arrows for me to figure out that the bow shot phenomenal, but it and I couldn't get along because of an injury I have. It's brand new. It was brand new. <laughs> and I put a new set of strings and cables and stuff like that on it. I got it at a, a very good price because of some connections. And I was asking right at dealer cost for this bow, which is not a cheap bow. And a guy tried to lowball me by like $300. And I said, no, I Thanks, but no thing. And I yep. ended up selling it within a couple of days, anyways. But this guy was like, I, cussed, I he, he was he mad. Insulted him. I yeah. insulted him, and I'm, I'm like, no, this is what I need. If you want it, great. And the guy that ultimately bought it, he goes, I had no idea. This thing's brand new. Yeah. <laughs> 
So yeah, with a hundred dollar set of strings, that, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and timed and tuned, and I yeah. adjusted the the draw length, and the guy sent me a rest, and I set it up for him, and when he got it, he just he since bought another another bow for different purposes and has sent it to me from Pennsylvania. So it's, See, it I, all worked I could, out. I couldn't but do we, Doug's job because it'd all be set up like, I'm sorry, but I can't take this bow apart. It shoots perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> Vinny, you, I'll take the side off, but you have to buy everything else that's yeah. on this bow. <laughs> you remember that orange uh, contender that you and I swapped in and out of? When I went to sell that bow. Yeah, I remember it was. Oh, my. I sold it to a guy for a great price, right? I took the tape off of the grip, the grip here, <laughs> and shipped it to the guy. It cleaned, the, cleaned it all up. A little right? different <laughs> color after it took the grip. Three days later, off. I get a message from him. Hey, can you knock $100 off of this? Well, what for? This bow's faded. I'm like, what? Yeah, yeah, it's faded. So he sends me a picture on where the grip tape was. It was just a shade darker than yeah. the rest of the bow. I'm like, no. <laughs> when you're and buying he, a used he bow. Fi- finally... He was so belligerent about it. I said, just send me the bow back. I'll send you your money back. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm not dealing with and this. And he did, didn't he? And, yeah, he did. I got the, the bow back and sold it for $100 more than what it sold it to him for. And if you're that guy, that that's fine. I mean, right. I, I've got friends that are that way that, you know, if they're going hunting, their pants have to have the same camo as their shirt. And if one's faded more than the other, they can't go hunting because they don't match. I get that. <laughs> but... If you're uh, if you're buying a guy. used bow, you're probably you probably shouldn't for one. You should buy new and and hold it, but ask for a ton of pictures. Right. Okay. Yeah. So. And you're right, Jack. This time of year is a great time to buy one. I should have lowballed you, Bob. <laughs> you did. <laughs> like <laughs> you set the price. Oh. How can I lowball you if you set the price? We much, just know they're saving the best for last. <laughs> much like most vehicles, bows are a terrible investment. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so buying used is really smart. Right. You know, if if the bow was really good, you know, I, we can all name certain models that have been extremely popular. And in two years or one year, people are going to sell them because the new stuff comes out. Mm-hmm. And that really good, really popular bow is now cut in half. Yeah, it's no good yep. anymore. But it's <laughs> – so so go pick them up. And We're all guilty them. of it. Yeah. Got to well, have it. I used to be. Can't I've been anymore. giving mine away. I'm, so. I'm running into a problem. Well, hey, Doug, Jake. <laughs> we've been at it for over two hours. We really appreciate you coming very, very much. Um, I enjoyed it. Uh, and I was kind of joking earlier about him being the number one string maker in the United States for 20 years running, but it is the truth. He is the best string maker in – the country he's the best bow tuner in the country and you guys need to um send your bows to him and have him worked on just it this is a bad time of year it just so happened we had him come in after he Holy killed crap what did that cost you <laughs> <laughs> you don't agree you're over at his shop all the time you gave That's me directions to his house. house. Yeah. <laughs> but no, seriously, he, does he, okay. is, <laughs> he knows what he's doing. He he probably knows bows better than anybody around. And so um, I'll have all the information you need to contact Doug in the uh, in the show notes, and we'll put it up on Facebook and everything else. So you guys have anything else for Yeah, we're going to have a giveaway. If you can text Jack what state Doug killed his elk in, we're going to give you Gary free. You just pay the shipping. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> There's some stipulations with that. We'll name them after we find out who wins. We're starting to lose it here. So, All right, guys. Thanks for listening. Vinny lost it uh, years ago. Just go to bowdudes.com. You can find all the information to contact us there. And so thanks for listening again, and we'll see you later. Thanks, Doug. Thanks, and be safe. See, see you. Funny papers. Shut up and shoot. Bye. No, we didn't. <laughs> Doug was supposed to say bicycle, but he didn't. <laughs>